All right, uh, so any questions from the first part of behavioral medicine we covered last time? Now that let's keep going with it. Um, so we'd moved into talking about uh, bipolar disorder. We got through all of our depression meds. Now we're looking at our mood stabilizers. And so lithium's a big one. That was kind of the gold standard for a really long time. Still used uh, with some occasion, as you'll see. But uh, there's a lot of monitoring that goes along with it. There's a lot of interactions you have to worry about. So because of that, it's kind of taken a little bit of a backseat compared to some of our um, anti-epileptic drugs, which we'll talk about. Anyway, uh, similar what we saw with a lot of antidepressants, you don't want to discontinue lithium abruptly because it can lead to relapse of symptoms. Um, and that should be corrected, which I meant to do. It should say not remission, but relapse, right? Um, oh, that wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense. But um, in some patients who can't have enough efficacy with just one drug by itself, sometimes you can get some additional benefit from combining things. Lithium could be mixed with something else, which we'll talk about as alternatives in just a few minutes here. So adverse effects, this is the big thing that is going to limit its use for a lot of patients. Um, it can range anywhere from a third to almost all patients may develop some degree of side effects from this. And a lot of it goes back to the level you're going to be dealing with, right? So we said, you know, 0.6 to 1.2 is the usual therapeutic level. Anytime you get above that is when you're going to start to notice some of these adverse effects here. Now, some of it could be related back to peak level um, kind of a peak level effect you can see with that. So that's why we use a lot of extended release products to kind of avoid that peak dose effect. And so a lot of it could be things like G, uh, GI distress. Why do you think you see like an osmotic diarrhea? Because lithium is a metal, right? So just like if you have too much sodium in the GI tract, and we'll talk about that when we get to GI later on, um, but too many electrolytes in the GI tract can cause water to, you know, water goes wherever the, the electrolytes are. You know, water follows, follows salt, and, uh, you know, lithium looks just like sodium to the body. You're going to cause a lot of that osmotic diarrhea to occur there because that water is going to kind of flood into the GI tract. So that's a common thing you'll see. Um, and then a lot of it could be also neuromuscular. We're going to see a lot of weakness associated with this. And you can also develop this polydipsia and nocturia to go along with that, right? Because, again, increased salt load, your kidneys want to get rid of that, so I can lead to some of that polydipsia. Um, or that increased salt load will cause uh, you need to intake more water, but then you'll also see polyuria go along with that. Okay, chronic effects. This is the other big thing you're going to see, long-term sort of usage of this. You're going to see this fine hand tremor that can develop in up to about half of patients. Um, again, using long-acting formulations can kind of avoid some of this because you avoid that peak dose effect you're going to see with the immediate release preparations. And then also using things like beta blockers can kind of help to limit this. Um, again, not sure the full mechanism. We don't know why that is, but it's probably due to blocking some of the beta receptors on the skeletal muscle itself can help to deal with some of those tremors there. Other big things we can see is the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Anyone know what that is? Be very thirsty. Um, and just because of diabetes in there doesn't mean it has anything to do with sugar, really. So it's kind of a misnomer there. You'll learn more about that when we get into talking about uh, the renal stuff later on. Um, but basically, this is where we're going to see a ton of polyuria. It's really the big thing. You're going to be losing a lot, a lot of water um, through the kidneys there. And basically, it has to do with an issue of not having enough, um, either enough vasopressin being released from the uh, pituitary, or you're going to find that the kidney's not really responding to vasopressin very well. And so this is one of those things you can see with that, where you can actually end up um, causing kind of a, a relative lack of effective vasopressin within the kidneys, and so you see this diabetes insipidus that occurs there. We'll talk more about that later, so just know this is something that can occur with lithium. It's kind of a unique thing with that. And it can be treated actually with loop or thiazide diuretics. Does that seem like it makes sense? A ton of polyuria, but then you're treating it with diuretics. Doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? However, it does um, have to do with sort of resetting the kidneys and as far as to what they're sensing as far as sodium goes. Again, don't worry too much about that. We'll talk about that later when we get to the kidney stuff um, later on in this class. Just know that's kind of the general treatment for it. Anyway, um, other things you can see some nephrotoxicity with this and then actually um, some hypothyroidism due to the fact that lithium can actually help to uh, interrupt thyroid hormone synthesis. That's something you may see with those patients. And again, hypothyroidism can also look a lot like what other behavioral disorder Depression, right? Yeah, so that's one of those things where, you know, you have to go through, look at their levels, look at the TSH, you know, T3 levels to see what the heck's going on with that. Make sure that's not uh, playing a role here. Um, other things we can see, see some cardiac effects uh, here, kind of non-specific non stuff that can develop. Um, some uh, skin manifestations, you can develop some acne, some dermatitis with that, and then weight gain. And then some of the um, sort of the neurologic effects it has, uh, that occurs with kind of chronic high level doses include things like ataxia, slurred speech, et cetera. Um, and then the overdose can be a big problem here as well. We see this a lot with our bipolar patients where maybe um, you, know, you can find either 
into the spectrum where they stop taking all their meds completely or they end up overdosing on their medications. Um, and so this can be a problem where you can have acute overdoses which can be bad, um, but more often than not, we're going to see this kind of acute on chronic sort of issues here where you have this chronic overdosing over a period of time. Either they're taking too much of it or you can find that their elimination of the drug is too, uh, is not uh, not sufficient and their levels are going to build up, right? So once you start to get to levels like two or three mill equivalents per liter, that's where we start to run into things like seizures that can develop and it's going to be very difficult to treat. And in fact, when we actually get rid of it out of the body, it actually undergo hemodialysis, which again, we'll talk about later in the uh, renal stuff. Uh, as far as interactions go, anything that puts the kidneys into a salt retentive state is going to lead to retention of lithium. So that means if I were to give a patient a diuretic, cause them to waste sodium, the kidneys are going to respond by trying to hold on to that sodium, right? It's going to activate that renoangiotensin system. That means you're also going to be holding on to lithium as well. If I were to give, say, a patient NSAIDs, that's going to do what to the kidneys? We talked about that afferent and the efferent arterial. Remember, the by losing those prostaglandins in the afferent arterial, you're going to cause that vasoconstriction, at least a lower GFR. That can lead to holding on to more lithium, right? So these are all things you have to think about. And very frequently, what we'd run into from the, at least when I was in fellowship and I see these lithium overdoses, more often than not, it was a patient who had got, was on lithium long-term for bipolar disorder, and then they had uh, another drug added onto their regimen, and no one actually went through and actually adjusted their dose or checked their levels. So for instance, I had one patient who got started on an ACE inhibitor, and that ended up decreasing their clearance of lithium, came with a level that was too high, developed seizures, and we were able to treat that effectively. But it's one of those things where you have to check your interactions anytime you're adding on a new med or changing any doses or anything. There's no SIP enzyme interactions here because it's lithium. It's just a metal. It's just going to get cleared through the kidney, so there's no actual metabolism of the drug that occurs there. Okay, so then, so I mentioned lithium was kind of the gold standard for a good long time. Now we're starting to use more of our anticonvulsants for bipolar disorder. I'm going to talk about them briefly here, but we're going to get into them in much more detail in the neurology section, which is kind of, this is all going to be on the same test anyway, so uh, don't fret about that too much if we don't get into all the details here. And if you covered, you haven't covered any uh, epilepsy stuff yet, right? No, okay. So this will be kind of your first introduction to these medications. Now, one of the more common ones uh, you'll see being used is valproic acid. There are several different brand names for it, depending on if you're dealing with a long-acting formulation of the liquid. So you see things like Depakote, Depakon, Depakine. If you see like a Depa, um, that's usually referring to valproic acid, typically. And so um, it's used as a, uh, here, as a mood stabilizer. If you're using it for epilepsy, it obviously it's used as an anticonvulsant. And so this is really good for either acute manic symptoms, they're having sort of an acute issue coming in, or better for chronic therapy as well, right? So you can kind of use it for either one here. Now, we don't know the full mechanism for how it's working for bipolar disorder specifically, um, but some of it is thought to be doing uh, some mimicry as far as acting sort of like GABA. That's some of these postsynaptic receptor sites. And GABA typically does what in the brain? Slows things down, right? It's the brakes on the system. It, uh, typically, when you activate a GABA receptor, what does that do to the neuron? It's gonna, and, we'll, and we'll talk about this uh, at length when we get into um, the neurology section, but basically it opens up chloride channels, right? You're going to allow chloride to flow into the neuron. And what does that do to the electric potential of that neuron? It's much more negative, and it get, becomes hyperpolarized, right? It's going to be much more difficult to have an action potential. You know, we'll cover this in more detail, but just know it's going to make the neurons more difficult to fire, so it's kind of slowing everything down, right? So by mimicking GABA, some of these effects here, you kind of slow things down. It makes sense because if you're in a manic state, there, you know, the, the neurons are firing too frequently. You're seeing that sort of um, that increase in activity for the patients who are trying to slow things down is going to be good for them from that standpoint. And we'll talk about that kind of acute treatment as well in a little bit, and that will make sense when we talk about the drugs we use for that. So anyway, um, Keep in mind as well that whenever you're combining these drugs together, so if you were to combine lithium with valproic acid, you're going to see increased risk for side effects due to drug interactions. Um, you're going to see with that. However, this is much better tolerated for the most part than lithium is. Uh, but you will see some common side effects. And so this is where you can see a lot of um, CNS slowing, which can lead to this depressed mental status. You can see things like ataxia, lethargy. And then uh, notably, valproic acid is pretty um, well known to cause hepatotoxicity. Again, good, good thing to know about valproic acid. You want to check your LFTs whenever you're uh, administering that. And the other big thing you can see is the hyperammonemia that can develop. And this is basically due to uh, valproic acid's action in the liver, leading to a relative deficiency of something called carnitine. And you lose that carnitine, you're not able to process ammonia very well, and so you're going to see this hyperammonemia. And we know what happens when you have high ammonia levels. 
it causes a lot of CNS depression and, and altered mental status, like things like ataxia, lethargy, et cetera. So again, a lot of times, a lot of patients who will come in, uh, they may have a normal valproic acid level, but they're coming in because they have slurred speech, ataxia, et cetera. Um, and then we'll say get pneumonia level, and that's usually elevated. So that's one of the things you always want to check for uh, when you have someone on valproic acid. You know how you would treat that? Have a carnitine deficiency, you give them. L-carnitine, yeah, so if you ever see levocarnitine, that's something we're giving to help those uh, patients uh, handle that ammonia better, right? Um, so anyway, so again, you want to make sure you're following the hepatic function panels there, and then usually a therapeutic range, you know, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this for the test, but be able to at least interpret if I give you a high level or a low level, kind of what that means for the patient there. Typical range you're going to see with bipolar disorder, and this is pretty variable. Um, usually with lithium, like you want to keep it within a very tight range, that 0.6 to 1.2. If you get outside of that, you're going to see a lot of toxicity. With this one, pretty wide range because it's so well tolerated. The therapeutic index is much wider. Um, you can shoot for much higher levels for some patients, so you may get up to 150, maybe 200 in some patients, and they'll do just fine with it. So, um, so you know, just as an example, if I were to ask a question on a test and to say, you know, a patient comes with a valproic acid level that's 175, normal range between 50 and 125, and so the patient's not having any issues, um, bipolar disorder is well controlled, what do you want to do with that level? What do you want to do with the dose? You would say, don't do anything, right? Just because the level's high doesn't mean you want to necessarily change your regimen, okay? Treat the patient, not the... The number. That's a big mantra they're going to uh, realize is that just because the level is elevated or low or just because it's abnormal doesn't mean you have to do anything with it necessarily. And in fact, this is actually a good case. Um, I was on call for the Poison Center the other night and I had a, uh, a doc call up from the hospital and they said, hey, we've got this uh, young patient here. He decided he wanted to harm himself. And so he took a bunch of Excedrin. Anyone know what's in Excedrin? Caffeine, aspirin, and Acetaminophen, okay. Acetaminophen can be pretty dangerous over the course of a couple of days. Aspirin, is that anyone know if that's dangerous or not? 100%, that's a very dangerous drug to overdose on. Said he also smoked some pot and then drank a handle of vodka. Think, oh, okay. Guy's having a pretty good night, right? So anyway, so you, you hear all this, and so, you know, someone found him. Uh, someone decided to call 911, so they got him transported to the ER, okay. They do levels for everything. They do a Tylenol level. What do you think that came back at? Zero, okay. Uh, I did an aspirin level, guess what it came back at? Zero. I uh, did alcohol level, guess what it came back at? Zero. So you think, okay, well this guy did all this stuff, you know, roughly three or four hours ago. What do you think is going on? Well, how can you tell when the patient's lying to you? Their lips are moving, right? So again, this is a young guy trying to harm himself. He's not in the right state of mind. He's probably just saying a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe he did this a couple of days before. Who knows, right? But anyway, but we're going off of the lab values and it's not backing up his story. So, okay, well, let's go ahead and just manage this. So, um, but the problem is, and anyone know what happens when you try to commit suicide or you try to harm someone else, what the police will do to you? They put you under? Baker Hatch. Right? So this patient was Baker Hatch. So he's going to be monitoring the hospital anyway. Um, but he had bipolar disorder on his list of, of uh, behavioral health issues. And he was on valproic acid. So, of course, whenever you have someone who's intentionally harming themselves and you have a drug they could have taken, you want to check for it, right? You want to make sure um, that, you know, the level is not too high. So the valproic acid level was cooking, was waiting to come back, um, but the doc also smartly got a pneumonia level. The pneumonia level came back, usually like anything less than 30 is usually pretty normal. Uh, this level came back at 69. So the doc was like, well, what do I do with this level? It's elevated. And I said, well, how's the patient? You know, is he, does he have any signs or symptoms that are consistent with hyperammonemia? It's like, no, he's just pissed off. He's just mad he's here. He's fighting with the nurses. He can walk fine. He's, uh, you know, alert and oriented times three. So what do we do with it? So what do you think we did with it? He's asymptomatic. He's got this high level. It's more of an incidental finding. Honestly, we didn't do anything with it. So, okay, well, this is not something to do with it acutely in the ER. It's going to be a minute anyway. We'll track the levels. We'll see where they're going to make sure they're not elevating, right? We want to make sure they're not trending in the wrong direction, but that's something you can do with on the outpatient side. So I said, okay, well, you got this level, but he's asymptomatic from it currently. Just don't do anything with it, right? So again, just because the level's elevated doesn't mean you have to do something about it, okay? So it's an incidental finding. He can do outpatient levocarnitine therapy. He's going to stay home about prolic acid. This guy's got other bigger issues to, to work with throughout that time. That kind of makes sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So you'd expect him to be stumbling around, to be slurring his speech, you know. And again, with that story, you'd expect him to be doing that anyway with all the alcohol and the marijuana and everything else on top of it. But he wasn't ex experiencing any of that. So obviously, he was something is inconsistent in the story, right? So again, you don't want to necessarily say the patient's lying, but there's inconsistencies there, right? So um, that's one of those things where the level's elevated, but they're symptomatic. Don't do anything with it, right?
Uh, otherwise, we could have given them L-carnitine therapy, could have got that leveled down, um, and, and you go from there, right? So that way, because again, the, the problem was that the doc was wondering, well, if I medically clear this patient, he's still under Baker Act, right? So he still needs a psychiatric evaluation. Um, I can't do any more levels on him. Like once you medically clear him, you can't really do anything else with him. Um, otherwise, they're not medically clear. So that's why he was really at, at that conundrum of like, well, what, what do I do with this? You know, do I need to actually track this? Do I need to actually treat this? And ultimately, we said no, right? So that way, he can um, be medically cleared that much sooner, and then undergo a psychiatric evaluation, get sent off to a Baylor Health place, and then and you know, it speeds up the process, right? So that way, you can see more patients. You can get someone else into that hospital bed. That makes sense. Anyway, just I thought it was an interesting case. It was at least somewhat pertinent to what we're talking about here. I will try to limit my tangents from here on out. It's kind of a long story. Anywho, um, the valproic acid is very commonly used for bipolar disorder. Another drug we use very commonly is called carbamazepine or Tegretol is the brand name you see a lot with that. This actually is pretty structurally similar to the TCAs, remember the tricyclic antidepressants. Anyone remember what kind of main side effects you see with that? Sedation and anticholinergic stuff. That's kind of the main things you're going to find, at least with therapeutic dosing. A lot of anticholinergic effects, a lot of sedation seen with that. Well, guess what? You can see a little bit of that with carbamazepine as well because it is structurally very similar to um, uh, the TCAs there. Again, we're not really sure why it works specifically for bipolar disorder, but for epilepsy, we do know it's going to be a sodium channel blocker. Now, if you remember back to our action potentials, what typically causes a rapid rise in electric potential for a neuron? Increase sodium influx, right? You open up those sodium channels, allow sodium to come in, you trigger off an action potential. When you block sodium channels, you're going to be slowing down that process or stopping that process altogether and hopefully preventing an action potential from occurring. So that's why I use it for seizures in that way. And we'll talk about this more in depth when we get to neurology. But um, the sodium channel blockade is the main mechanism of action for carbamazepine. Again, why it works for bipolar, we don't specifically know. We just know that it does work. And typically, we'll use this in patients who maybe are not a good candidate for lithium therapy. So for instance, if you had a patient, um, you know, and I could ask a test question, right? I could ask what would be the best drug to start out a patient for their bipolar disorder. And I can say, well, they already have cirrhosis of the liver. Their liver function is poor. So you would say no about pro acid, right? Because that would be a bad option for that patient. And then I can say they have really poor kidney function. You would say that'd be a bad candidate for lithium because that is entirely linearly eliminated. It wouldn't be a good candidate for that. Maybe carbamazepine would be a good option, right? These are things you want to kind of think about. Um, or if they're refractory, you know, they're on good levels of lithium and really wasn't doing anything for them, this is, could be a good backup option. Now, uh, again, here's the therapeutic range, you know, 4 to 12, pretty tight ranges we're going to be shooting for here. And then uh, with all the, you know, anti-epileptic drugs, you're going to find that typically CNS slowing, CNS depression is a very common thing you're going to see with those. So ataxia, lethargy, et cetera. Um, one of the unique things you're going to find with carbamazepine is a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion or SIADH. What do you think that causes? So I've got too much antidiuretic hormone. What does that do to the kidneys? I'm going to hold on to too much water. Absolutely right. Because remember, ADH is going to be uh, placed into the, to the collecting ducts. It's going to cause the aquaporin channels to be there. It's going to try to hold on to more water. So you're going to try to hold on to more water. And what do you think it does to your sodium levels? It's going to dilute it. It's going to dilute it out, and you're going to have hypo atremia that can develop from this, right? So it's a common thing you're going to find. Um, usually patients will have a uvolemic hyponatremia, and SIDH is a common cause for that, right? So again, sodium levels will be something you want to track with carbamazepine. Actually, see, there's a cousin to carbamazepine even worse for causing that, but something you want to watch out for. And also, because it's blocking sodium channels, we like it to be just specific for the neurons, but it's not going to do that. So it can also affect where else are sodium channels really important on the heart, right? So you can see some cardiac conduction delays that can occur with that as well. We saw that sodium channel blockade with the TCAs. This is kind of a bleed over effect from that as well, right? Anyway, other things you can find. This is going to induce CYP3A4, right? Not inhibit, but induce 3A4. And in fact, it can actually increase its own metabolism. It's what we call auto-induction of its own metabolism, in which case you actually have to taper up the dose over a period of a few weeks to make sure that their levels stay consistent because they're going to be increasing those levels of the enzymes, right? Uh, so 3A4 is going to be increased. That means levels of other drugs metabolized by CYP3A4 are going to go up or down. You want to go down because I'm inducing those enzymes. I have more of those enzymes available. Um, you can also see this can be a problem with other anticonvulsants that are metabolized by, through CYP3A4, which can be problematic, and also oral contraceptives. And the estrogen can be more rapidly eliminated. So what do you think that could lead to? Accidental pregnancies, right? And so we know bipolar patients, especially in these manic episodes, what might they be partaking in? Risky behaviors, right? So you would put them on oral contraceptives potentially to hopefully prevent pregnancy, and they maybe are on carbamazepine. No one uh, maybe, you know, uh, address that, that drug interaction there, and they engage in some risky behavior, and then they get pregnant. Not great, right? Um, so what could you do instead? <laughs> 
we put them on an alternative, right? So again, when we get to ob guidance section later on, we'll learn that there's alternative forms of contraception you could use. There's things like intrauterine devices um, that don't undergo uh, systemic absorption uh, that can be very useful there. There are certain implantable ones you can do um, that could be good alternatives. We'll talk about those later on ob guidance, but just know uh, that this is a, an important interaction because again, um, probably one of the worst side effects you can have from a drug is an accidental pregnancy, right? No one wants that to happen. So. Anyway, um, other things you can find are some of these uh, interactions where you actually have drugs being displaced from binding sites. So, for instance, valproic acid, if you were to combine this with carbamazepine, which is not un totally uncommon, you'd find that it would displace carbamazepine from the proteins in the serum. And then what could that lead to? You know, yeah, you'd have more physiologically active carbamazepine, which could lead to more side effects. Okay. All right. Now, oxcarbazepine. The drug uh, brain name is trileptal is actually a, a derivative of carbamazepine. The levels you can't necessarily get um, can't get a uh, carbamazepine level to detect levels of oxcarbazepine. They're structurally different enough to where they won't cross react. But um, just know that it's going to work very similar to, to carbamazepine. The one thing that would uh, really differentiate its um, its activities is it actually has worse SIDA. So you're more likely to see hyponatremia with oxcarbazepine than you are with just carbamazepine. So just be aware of that. Um, again, less data with this one is kind of again. If they failed other forms of therapy, this is a good backup to that. But again, think about lithium, valproic acid. Those are kind of your most common go-to sort of drugs for bipolar disorder, typically. Um, as I mentioned, more SIDH, very typical, uh, uh, similar adverse effects to carbamazepine there. Um, this one will also not only induce 3A4, but also can inhibit CYP2C19. So you're starting to see how there's some complex interactions that can be going along here. So you as a clinician are going to be expected to memorize every single CYP interaction out there. No, but what can you do instead? Look it up, right? So again, if you take anything away from my hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of lectures, is if you're not sure about something, look it up, right? Because again, you don't want to go with that bravado and say, oh, yeah, this is obviously it, and you're not really sure, and it's going to lead and in, in, get into trouble. Okay, um, other ones you may see being used, uh, other anti-epileptics used for uh, Bipolar disorder includes lamotrigine or lamictal is the brand name for that. This one is again going to be blocking sodium channels. It also inhibits glutamate release. And glutamate typically does what in the brain? It's excitatory, right? So it's kind of the opposite of GABA. And actually, glutamate gets turned into GABA eventually through its uh, metabolism. But glutamate is very excitatory. So if I were to inhibit release of glutamate, you can see how that would be kind of a global sort of negative sort of thing. It would slow things down essentially. Um, this is one that's kind of nice because it has both antidepressant and mood stabilizing sort of effects there. So you can kind of get a little bit of double duty with that. Um, but just be aware that things like valproic acid significantly decreases the clearance of lamotrigine. So you have to make sure you're adjusting your doses appropriately. It's not that you can't use the two together. It's just you need to make sure you're addressing it, make sure you're dropping the dose, um, usually by half, in fact, because the half-life is actually extending by, by almost double. And then uh, as far as adverse effects go, uh, lamotrigine, one of the big things to really note about this one is going to be the skin manifestations. Now, this can be a severe something like Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, which can be life-threatening. Uh, but uh, you're going to see rashes seen with this. You can have, um, and again, one of the things if you, uh, you when you educate patients, let them know if you see any rashes, blisters, they're forming here. They need to make sure they're they're addressing that. Either come back to see you or going to the ER because uh, that could eventually develop into something like Stevens-Johnson. So that could be a very um, potentially serious, life-threatening sort of thing. Um, you can see with the little McDowell. And actually, I saw a case of this. Um, not too long ago where uh, I had a patient who was being, actually being admitted there on, uh, they had a uh, genetic uh, disorder where they're very prone to having seizures. And so they had to be managed on three or four different ma uh, medications for their epilepsy. Um, and so they came in having severe rashes, skin blistering. Um, and so it was, they were diagnosed with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. They're coming in. And so the question is, well, you know, they have all these drugs on there for their epilepsy, but it's potentially causing SJS. You know, well, if you take them off all those drugs, what would happen? They can go back and having seizures, right? Which is typically not ideal for your patients because you're treating for one thing, but then you're causing another problem. So um, the question was, what do you do with all their home medications, right? So they obviously stopped the Lamotrigine. And so I was looking at that and I was like, oh, it's really interesting because you don't see Stephen Johnson's too common, at least in, in the pediatric hospital. It's like really interesting. But I was like, well, they're on all these other meds. Let me just double check because one of the things you'll find with a lot of anti-epileptics is they tend to cause a lot of skin manifestations like, like Stephen's Johnson. So when I had looked it up, I actually found like one or two of their other drugs that they're actually on still that the docs said, let's go ahead and continue this and cause it as well. So you have to call them, uh, let them know, hey, you know, this could be possibly interacting. It's probably the Lamictal. But it could be these other things are contributory as well. And I said, oh, wow, I didn't even know that. And so I ended up de seeing it, and we had to put them on alternative drugs there. So again, look this stuff up. Even if you're really sure, like, yeah, Lamotrigine, I know that causes SJS, but there are other things you can do it as well. So you want to make sure you look that thing, uh, those things up. Um, all right, 
So that's it for the mood stabilizing sort of drugs there. Any questions about those? Yes, sir. Um, when you're talking about the medication to slow things down or inhibit glutamate, slow things down, are you supposed to give those medications as a manic base of bipolar? That's a really good question. Yeah, so we'll talk about that um, in just a little bit. But typically, the question is like, kind of what state is the patient in right at that moment, right? So again, if they're in the middle of a manic state, and again, that could be as severe as they're, you know, threatening self-harm or harm to others, you know, really the kind of acute sort of manic breaks. Um, that's going to require very acute sort of attention to that. So we're going to use really the big guns that are really going to try to inhibit things and slow things down very significantly. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but uh, if not, if they're maybe in kind of those, one of those intermittent sort of phases there, you can start them off maybe on lower dose therapies of these mood stabilizers um, to try to help prevent them from going into one of those more manic states, right? So again, it all depends. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about some of the big guns you can use to really knock these patients down because you have some that will come in there, uh, you know, very dangerous to themselves and, and a lot of the hospital staff and you got you to do something about them. So we'll mention those in a second. Now, other drugs you can also use for bipolar disorder are going to include our antipsychotics. And these are definitely things that most of your faculty should probably be on. But again, it's like when the, the patients get the keys of the insane asylum. We're all running the, the show now, so you guys are our victims. Uh, anyway, um, so antipsychotics, we're going to talk about these. Um, again, you're going to find these with use in, in bipolar disorder, but um, also you can use it for patients with schizophrenia. Um, a lot of use for these medications here. But basically, what we're going to find there's first and second generation antipsychotics. Okay, have you talked about antipsychotics at all with Dr. Austin? A little bit, maybe? I'm not seeing a whole lot of recognition in your eyes, so I'm going to say no and just act like you haven't heard of it before, so good. Okay, so the first generation antipsychotics, their main mechanism of action is blocking dopamine 2 receptors. Okay, dopamine 2 receptor blockade is the main mechanism of action of the first generation antipsychotics. The second generation group of drugs, which we'll get into more detail and I'll show you what all those are, um, they will also block dopamine 2 receptors to some degree, a lot lesser degree as you'll see, and that's going to be important for some of the interactions and some of the uh, uh, side effects you see with that. But they also will in, in, end up inhibiting 5-HT2A receptors. 5-HT is another name for serotonin, right? So they have these serotonin 2A receptors. And I said there's a million different serotonin receptors that are out there. This one specifically is serotonin 2A. And so you're going to find that these are either effective for monotherapy or in combination therapy for treating acute manic episodes, right? So if you have a patient who's coming in um, and they're being very belligerent and they're, you know, threatening to harm staff or maybe they are harming staff, um, some of these are very good for treating that really acute sort of manic phase. Now, if you imagine you have someone coming in like that, um, who's quite dangerous, maybe they're trying to hit, you know, hit the, the nurses and whatnot, um, having to restrain them. Uh, what route of drug delivery do you think you want to go with? You want to go oral? Shoot them in the butt? <laughs> so the, the technical term? Shoot them in the butt. It's like, a, what's that gator show where they're just like, shoot them in the head? Like, um, I don't know, my parents watch a lot of that stuff, so whenever I go home, they're like, what is this TV? Uh, anyway. <laughs> Anywho, um, yeah, so you're right. So oral route is probably not going to be very good, right? So just like my two-year-old, whenever I try to get something orally, guess where it ends up? on me, right? So again, it's uh, not, not a good route for them. Um, IV, would that be a good route for those patients? If you can get an IV, right? That's the question. Can you actually get an IV? Can you be held still for long enough to actually get an IV place? So if you can't do IV, what can you do? Shoot them in the butt, right? So you can give them an IM injection. It doesn't have to be the butt. It could be the deltoid. It could be lots of places. But intramuscular injection is very easy. Um, relatively speaking, you still have to hold the patient down long enough to actually get the injection done. But quick, easy, you can get the patient calmed down. And then you can think about things like getting more definitive access like IV, um, IV route. So anyway, so again, um, think about the, which route the drug's going to be given because that can be very important. So we have some of these atypical antipsychotics, these second generation drugs that are um, good IM drugs that we can administer for some of these really acutely manic patients. But um, very good for treating the agitation, the aggression, the psychosis because they're very sedating. So we're going to be able to knock this patient down very quickly. Um, I want to talk about things like giving a little bit of vitamin H to a patient. That's usually when I'm talking about Haldol or Haloperidol. Very good for knocking patients down because they are going to be pretty sedate after that one, right? It's like getting hit by a Mack truck. They're just going to be nice and sedate, calm down. You can do whatever you need to with them. A um, lot of adverse effects are going to be seen with this, and I'll talk about this in more detail when we get into them. But, you know, things like worsening metabolic effects. This is long-term therapy with things like worsening type 2 diabetes, weight gain, dyslipidemia. You're going to find a lot of that seen with the antipsychotics. And, again, we'll talk about this in much more detail in just a few uh, slides here when we actually get to talking about schizophrenia. All right. Other alternative agents you may see being used for bipolar disorder include things like benzodiazepines. 
this will get talked about uh, in great detail in the neurology section. I know I keep trying to allude to all these things. I'm trying to keep you guys interested by being like, oh, guess what? Coming attractions. We'll talk about these drugs later. Um, <laughs> but the benzos are very good at slowing down things. These are going to be GABA agonists. They're going to actually be helping to uh, increase activity of GABA at the receptors to try to increase that chloride influx, to try to slow down those neurons and hyperpolarize them. Very good for acute manic symptoms, right? Uh, good for uh, acute anxiety, um, but very, very sedating, right? So we'll talk about much more of these uh, in, in more detail. Oftentimes, patients may be on chronic mood stabilizers, and they'll have PRN orders or PRN prescriptions for benzodiazepines, because oftentimes these drugs are not something you want to take necessarily every single day, but it's something you can use as needed to, hey, if you're getting a little anxious, if you notice, you know, you may be hitting into one of those kind of manic phases, take this, right, as needed. Um, other things you can see, things like calcium channel antagonists, uh, uh, this is used less commonly, uh, but some people believe that things like calcium channel blockers can be used to inhibit neurotransmitter release, maybe some synthesis of neurotransmitters. Um, so things like verapamil actually had some activity here as, as a mood stabilizer. You may see that occasionally. Um, the modipine is another one, would be a non, or which would be a dihydropyridine uh, that can actually get across that blood-brain barrier and has some anticonvulsant properties as well. So that could be potentially used. So generally, you want to start off with a mood stabilizing agent, so something like lithium, carbamazepine, valproic acid, any of those are totally fine. Or we'll talk about the second generation antipsychotics a little bit later on. Typically, second generation is what you want to go, in, uh, what you want to go with in, in, for the most part. Um, if they're having a lot of insomnia, anxiety, agitation, this is where the benzodiazepines can come into play. And then uh, something like oxcarbazepine can be used as an alternative. So the kind of fail therapy with something like valproic acid, maybe consider oxcarbazepine there. And then, as we mentioned, sometimes combination therapy is necessary, but double check those interactions. Because I've seen cases where someone uh, put valproic acid along with lamictal, didn't address the fact that the half-life of the lamictal is going to be doubled, and then they develop toxicity from that, right? So you've got to make sure you're addressing that, check your interactions beforehand. Um, they're having inadequate response, you know, common uh, double therapies include things like, you know, lithium plus anticonvulsant or lithium plus a second generation antipsychotic, or you may see something like an anticonvulsant like uh, valproic acid plus carbamazepine or, uh, you know, valproic acid plus a second generation antipsychotic. And again, we'll talk about these later on in this uh, slide set. Okay, so any questions on bipolar disorder? All right, I'm going to move forward. We're going to talk about antipsychotics. This is where specific we're talking about our drugs used for schizophrenia. So um, the etiology here, it's probably a lot of factors playing a role here. There's definitely some genetics here um, where, you know, if a, you have about a 10% chance of developing if you have a first degree relative that has it. If you have two, both parents have it, 40% uh, chance, right? So there's definitely some genetic components here, um, but we really don't know why it occurs here. Um, now, the thing we're going to be using to treat this, and again, we're going to talk about a couple of different sets of symptoms here, right? We're going to talk about the positive symptoms, the negative symptoms, and then the cognitive symptoms here. So we're going to find that these are being manifested through different neurotransmitters. So dopamine and serotonin are going to be the big ones we're going to talk about here. So some people believe there's a dopamine receptor defect where you actually have hypoactivity of dopamine in some places, but hyperactivity in other places to different sets of symptoms here. Um, so you can see things like dopamine hyperactivity in the caudate nucleus, hypoactivity in the frontal cortex is where we think we see a lot of cognitive and negative sort of symptoms that can develop from that. Um, and then there's also meso mesocaudate here. So we think there's some hyperactivity and this is where we're going to see a lot of positive symptoms. And I'll talk about what those are in just a few minutes here. And you guys haven't covered schizophrenia yet, right? Okay, so again, this will be your, kind of your first uh, uh, you know, foray into it. Um, we also think there's probably some glutamate activity that's going to be playing a role here, but the big thing we're going to note is that serotonin and dopamine are our main neurotransmitters we're going to be affecting uh, with our drugs here. Okay, so just note that. So if I were to show you a picture, kind of what's going on here, and, and we're just going to focus on things that are pertinent to us. Uh, imagine here we have these dopaminergic neurons here, right? These are releasing dopamine. Notice here the receptors that can affect it. You have things like nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but also we have GABA receptors that are here as well. Normally, GABA is going to do what to the system? Slow it down, shut it down, right? So maybe you have underactivity here. We're going to find that you have these dopamine uh, neurons. And again, they can have several different projections. Uh, you're going to see here where they will release dopamine on different places. So here we have the frontal cortex. Imagine here if you have hypoactivity, they're not releasing enough uh, serotonin or uh, dopamine here, you're going to end up developing a certain set of symptoms. This also means you're going to have some of these feedback loops that are going to be interrupted. And normally this would be a, an inhibitory sort of circuit here with this underactivity of dopamine affecting this. You're going to find they actually have too much dopamine being released here in the nucleus accumbens. Basically just know that in some places you're going to have too little dopamine activity and in other places you're going to have too much dopamine activity. And our drugs, you're going to find, um, you know, if I do things like block dopamine, 
in places where it's hypoactive to begin with, you're going to see worsening of those symptoms, right? So again, it gets very complicated, and we'll get into those drugs in, in just a minute here. Anywho, um, so when they develop when you develop schizophrenia, oftentimes uh, the brain is going to lose touch with reality. You're going to find they have these um, things like hallucinations, especially like they hear voices. Uh, you can have these delusions, you know, like uh, that I'm a really funny professor. Uh, definitely, you know, delusions of grandeur from that standpoint. Um, you know, all these things are going to be developing. And some of these, uh, when you have things that are present, that are not actually really there. When you have these kind of like auditory hallucinations and things, those are what we call those positive symptoms there. Um, also, their affect is going to be pretty well affected here additionally. So they have a pretty flat affect, maybe inappropriate, maybe pretty labile, going from, uh, say, very flat to maybe uh, intense anger or something like that very quickly. Also, things like personal hygiene tends to suffer. They're not really taking care of themselves very well. Oftentimes, not really taking, um, you know, holding a job very long or having a stable home life. Things like that can be a big thing here. So um, oftentimes these patients are very difficult to treat additionally because if they don't feel like they have an issue, do you think they're going to be compliant with their medications? Not really, right? So again, they're going, well, I don't need these medications. The voices are telling me that I'm totally fine. I'm not going to take the medication. So compliance is a huge issue with these patients here, which is oftentimes why we like to go with long-acting intramuscular varieties of, of some of these drugs. So actually we'll find that some drugs can have a nice long-acting effect, say up to three months, where you'll give it to the patient, inject it into them, and then that, that way they don't have a choice but to be compliant for that three-month period. So sometimes you'll see that. But um, Oftentimes they have a very high rate of substance abuse additionally, so not only can they have these um, uh, these symptoms here, but they can be aggravated by things like ethanol abuse, nicotine abuse as well. Uh, they're pretty rampant amongst these schizophrenic patients. So getting into the different symptoms here, and again, we'll mention certain drugs are better for different types of symptoms, as we'll see in a moment. Um, positive things are things that are there for the patient that aren't really there, right? So uh, things that should not be there. Uh, things like, you know, having these uh, sense of paranoia, um, hallucinations, unusual thought content, things like that. The negative symptoms are things that are missing that should be there, right? So for instance, they have this, uh, this very flat affect that's anhedonia. Anyone know what anhedonia is? Besides my metal band in high school? This is lack of like uh, feeling pleasure with things, right? You know, so they, you go to a, sit on a roller coaster and you're just sitting there not having any fun. Like, it's anhedonia, right? Um, a volition, like they don't really have uh, really the, the motivation to actually carry out actions, things like that, right? So these are, these are things that should be there that are missing, right? Those are those negative symptoms, oftentimes due to dopamine hypoactivity or underactivity in the frontal cortex. And then there's uh, cognitive effects here as well, which is probably mediated through the frontal cortex, things like impaired attention, memory, et cetera. Okay, so those are the main varieties of symptoms. Um, now, which one do you think can tend to be most dangerous? probably the positive symptoms, right? So again, if you are having these hallucinations and they're telling you to harm yourself, those can be very dangerous, right? So when you have a patient who's presenting, say, for instance, to the ER, where I saw a lot of these patients, um, oftentimes the positive symptoms are the things that are most dangerous that you need to deal with very much acutely. However, the cognitive negative effects are things you're going to be dealing with for the, for the long term as well. So again, which drugs we use can, is dictated based on how the patient's really presenting. So our desired outcome, uh, obviously we're going to find that pharmacotherapy is going to, oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so well, it depends on where you're talking about in the brain. So like we mentioned in the, in the nucleus accumbens, you had too much dopamine activity causing positive symptoms. And then in the frontal cortex, you had dopamine hypoactivity leading to those negative symptoms. Absolutely, yeah. So it could be either either or in those cases there. Um, but you can imagine if it's uh, you're dealing with the positive symptoms and you're decreasing dopamine activity, well, that's going to do it globally. And so that means the negative symptoms can be even worse, right? You're going to see even, even worse in effects from that. So again, it can be difficult when you get to the pharmacotherapy. But pharmacotherapy is key here, right? Most patients are going to need to be managed on some form of medication. Um, does that mean is that the only thing we're going to do? No, we're going to use things like cognitive behavioral therapy is going to be playing a role here as well. Um, but you need to be really assertive with your therapy in the first five years or so. You want to kind of get that under control um, before a patient has, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, their social, um, you know, settings you can really go down, go down the drain there. So again, a lot of deterioration can happen there. So you want to start early and start heavy. Um, typically, um, you need to target what symptoms you're really looking for, right? So if they're presenting, presenting to the ER and they're a harm to themselves or others, like you got to deal with those positive symptoms first. That's the acute thing you got to deal with. Um, they're just presenting to your clinic, behavioral health clinic, and they, you know, they're just now starting to get, get the diagnosis. They have this kind of flat affect. Those are the things you can deal with more on the chronic uh, sort of sensor. So again, it all depends. Um, but typically, usually about three months or so is kind of the time frame to really see how the patients are really going to be responding to these uh, medications. Um, we'd like to minimize adverse effects. However, the drugs we're going to use here are just ripe with adverse effects. You're gonna see there's a lot of problems with this, which is again, is a problem because if the patient doesn't think there's anything wrong with them and you're giving these medications that's making them feel worse, 
again, compliance is going to be a big problem here, right? And then obviously we want to hopefully decrease hospitalizations if possible. Um, you know, achieve good compliance. Sometimes we have to use different routes of medication administration to do so. Um, hopefully decreases recurrent episodes, right? Anyway, so getting into uh, the different classes of antipsychotics, there's going to be the first generation and the second generation. First generation is also sometimes called the typical antipsychotics. Second generation is sometimes called the atypical antipsychotics. Okay. Um, so the first generation ones, their main mechanism of action is to decrease activity at the dopamine 2 receptor. So these are going to be dopamine 2 receptor antagonists. This means they're going to be blocking the effects of dopamine, which means they're very good at decreasing the positive symptoms here, right? So decreasing that nucleus accumbens, dopamine signaling by blocking those receptors. So it could be releasing all the dopamine at once, but the receptors are going to be occupied by these drugs here. Um, but as I mentioned, by doing that, it'd be nice if I could just target those dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens. I can't do that, though. The drug kind of acts everywhere. So you're going to find it's going to worsen a lot of those negative symptoms, right? So that avolition, the anhedonia, that flat affect is going to be worsened by these first-generation sorts of drugs, okay? Again, so by blocking this dopamine activity right here, you're going to be decreasing those positive symptoms, okay? So you can imagine these receptors being blocked up by the, uh, the first-generation antipsychotics. However, it's going to be worsened here because you're going to have less activity at the frontal cortex, right? Okay, so adverse effects, things we're going to be seeing here. So when you block dopamine, typically you're going to find a reciprocal increase in prolactin, okay? So you're going to find this hyperprolactinemia that can occur here, which can lead to things like menstrual irregularities, can lead to infertility, can lead to gynecomastia, okay? Does anyone know what you give when you have patients who have hyperprolactinemia? And they can't get pregnant, what do you give them? They should give them dopamine agonist. You can do the opposite effect here. You should give them dopamine agonist to decrease prolactin levels. So again, there's kind of a seesaw sort of effect between dopamine and prolactin. So when I decrease dopamine activity, you're gonna find increased prolactin levels, okay? So menstrual irregularities, that gynecomastia is, is most often seen there, okay? Um, other things you're gonna find is another seesaw sort of effect, and this will become more prominent when we talk about Parkinson's disease in a little bit, um, is gonna be the seesaw effect between dopamine and acetylcholine. If I block dopamine, you're going to find there's increased acetylcholine activity. We'll talk about those side effects and how that manifests a little bit later on here. And then the main thing this is going to manifest as the by blocking dopamine is going to be what we call these extra pyramidal side effects. I've never heard of EPS or extra pyramidal side effects before. It's a very common set of symptoms uh, or side effects that are associated with these first generation drugs here, right? And basically, and if you think about Parkinson's, what is, what is Parkinson's essentially? It's the pathophysiology there. Lack of dopamine, right? You lose those dopaminergic neurons. Well, I can basically induce Parkinson's in a patient by blocking the do same dopamine receptors, okay? So whenever I give a patient a first-generation antipsychotic, you're going to see signs and symptoms that look a lot like Parkinson's, right? It's associated with that. So things like catatonia, you're going to see this motor rigidity here. You're going to see tremor associated with that. A lot of that tremor is actually due to acetylcholine, and we'll, we'll mention that in, in neurology later on. But you can also have this dystonia. Uh, that can be pretty problematic for the patient. Oftentimes, it's these involuntary muscle contractions that occur usually in the face, the neck, or the tongue uh, muscle, but you can really see it anywhere potentially, but usually those uh, most often get affected. Uh, kind of a funny story, um, maybe not funny for the patients, but funny uh, as, as the providers, um, is uh, uh, it was actually a family that came into the ER one time. It was a, a mom, a dad, and, and a, a son. Basically, were coming in, and what they had thought they had taken was Valium. Valium is, another, is a brand name for diazepam, which is a benzodiazepine, right? And we mentioned that's usually going to be slowing down. The system's kind of like getting drunk a little bit. Um, uh, and so what they thought, they bought some diazepam off of the street. The pills looked right. So, okay, we're going to take this. All of a sudden, they come into the ER, and they have all these protrusions that are happening. So basically, they're kind of catatonic almost. I guess the family that does drugs together stays together, I guess. But basically, you have these three people you're treating. Um, and they're just like, well, what in heck's going on? And in fact, one of the things you can do to treat these dystonia is actually give them Valium. So we're like, well, what in the heck's going on here? It's completely opposite of what we think. So fortunately, they had some of the pills left over. They said, oh, we well, we took these because again, you know, they were pretty scared and they were worried about what was going on. So they're actually pretty uh, forthright with, with what was going on, the history. Um, we took the pills, actually did a pill identification. Guess what? It also turns out that the manufacturer uh, makes their Valium look just like their haloperidol or haldol. And we're going to find that haldol is actually one of these first generation antipsychotics that's very well known for causing EPS. So basically what they had done is they basically induced a Parkinson-like syndrome in themselves by taking these drugs that they should not have taken. There you go. So again, don't do drugs. That's another thing you can take away from this class. <laughs> Look stuff up and then don't do drugs. Um, 
Right, so again, these dystonias are very, very common you're going to see with these EPS, especially if you have patients who, um, you know, are coming in with an acute psychotic break, you, uh, you know, are danger to themselves and others, um, give them a big dose of haloperidol, oftentimes you can end up seeing these uh, extrapyramidal side effects develop from that. So very commonly seen with the first generation antipsychotics. Other things we can see, uh, we have what we call akathisia. Anyone remember what I described akathisia is? Can't sit still. A lot of you probably have some akathisia right now. You're like, I just want to, when's he going to go to breaks and get out of here and walk around? Um, that's that, that restlessness, that agitation, uh, you know, a lot of pacing kind of goes along with that. Um, that's another thing you're going to find with uh, a dopamine receptor antagonist is going to be the akathisia. Uh, you know, usually not too big of a problem, but the patient feels pretty uncomfortable. Uh, and then what we have with long-term therapy is what we call tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is basically what uh, happens when you have this chronic dopamine receptor antagonism leading basically to this upregulation of these dopamine receptors. Your body becomes very, very sensitive to dopamine. And so what you end up developing, <coughs> excuse me, are some of these inappropriate muscle movement, right? We know dopamine is really important for causing um, uh, the, the muscles to move essentially, right? And so you're going to see things like these, uh, this kind of chronic chewing or licking motion that kind of have this involuntary control that is, you know, this... Uh, you know, maybe sticking their tongue out, thing like that. Um, you'll have this un, un, um, uh, limb movements that they're not really initiating themselves. Um, this is an irreversible sort of phenomenon. So when you have patients who are on these uh, first-generation antipsychotics for a long period of time, the EPS, that can go away. That's reversible. But the tardive dyskinesia is something you're going to find is going to be irreversible for these patients, right? It's a long-term sort of thing. Um, again, we don't necessarily like the first-generation drugs because of these long-term sort of effects here. So that's why the atypicals are so uh, nice because you're going to find you actually um, don't have a lot of the same issues there. But anyway, um, we'll talk about treatment for those side effects in just a little bit later, but actually this is not managed the same way as the EPS is. And actually you can make it worse if you were to treat uh, these uh, the same way. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, other effects you can see with antipsychotics, especially the first generations, they are very dirty in as far as what receptors are going to be interacting with. Sure, they block dopamine too very significantly, but they're going to interact with a lot of other receptors as well. So for instance, some of them can block alpha-1 receptors. That leads to? hypotension, <clears throat> postural hypotension, right, dizziness, you know, falls, things like that. So you have to be worried about that. And then a lot of them have anti-muscarinic activity. Okay. We all know the mnemonic for that. Might as a hatter, blinds a bat, et cetera, right? So I don't have to belabor that point. Um, this is actually good in some cases because this can actually help to block that increased acetylcholine you see due to that dopamine receptor antagonism. As I mentioned, when you block dopamine receptors, you're going to have an increased release of acetylcholine. And so by giving something that's an anticholinergic, guess what? You block a lot of those effects. So that can be somewhat um, useful in some cases. But in other cases, it can actually worsen tardive dyskinesia. We'll see a little bit later on. So other things, you're going to see some histamine receptor 1 antagonisms. You're going to see a lot of sedation seen with that. You can see some weight gain seen uh, with this. And then most of them do typically have some cardiac effects. So you can see things like QT prolongation. You see uh, sodium channel blockade, which can lead to QRS prolongation, can lead to some arrhythmias. Um, tachycardia can be seen usually due to the anti-muscarinic sort of effects. So you got to be careful with these because, again, these are also drugs that are prone for people to overdose on, either if they're taking it for their depression and they end up taking a bunch of them or if they're taking it for schizophrenia, whatever the case may be. These are drugs that are very frequently overdosed upon uh, by these patients so that can lead to a lot of cardiac issues. And again, imagine if you had someone who was on, say, for instance, amitriptyline for their depression, they're on, uh, say, lithium for their uh, bipolar disorder, and they happen to be on one of these first-generation antipsychotics, and they took them all together, it gets pretty difficult to manage those patients because, again, they have a lot of different competing drugs all interacting with one another, causing a lot of these effects here. And so, again, that's, again, that's why that's what drove me to toxicology in the first place. I was kind of like, wow, these drugs are really cool at therapeutic doses. What happens if we jack everything up to like 11? Um, and so it's really interesting seeing these patients, see how everything kind of interacts with one another, but it can be very difficult to manage, as you'll see. Anyway, um, another big thing you can find uh, that is unique to this uh, dopamine blockade with the first generation drug is what we call neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS. Now, this is actually going to look a lot like serotonin syndrome. So if you kind of go back, if you remember, what do we say serotonin syndrome looks like? What do they manifest? Usually things like, clonus. yeah, they develop clonus, hyperthermia, the hyperreflexia kind of goes along with that clonus and that increased muscle rigidity, usually autonomic instability, and ultra mental status, right? Those are the kind of the four cardinal signs you're going to find with serotonin syndrome. A lot of that looks very similar to NMS, but I'll talk about a few kind of key differences there. Um, basically, this is seen with drugs that are very, very highly potent at blocking the D2 receptors. And I'll kind of show you a chart in just a few minutes of the different uh, first generation antipsychotics. Some of them are very highly potent D2 blockers. Some of them are less so. They're going to be much more on the anticholinergic sort of side. So you're going to find there's kind of a spectrum that we'll see here in just a few minutes. But the ones you see this most commonly with are going to be haloperidol 
and then another drug called flufenazine. Haloperidol is probably the one you're going to run into much more commonly in the clinical setting. Um, but it can occur with any agent. Any drug blocking dopamine two receptors can cause this. And basically what you end up developing is this hyperthermia, this altered mental status, and hypertension, not a big thing. And then the, the kind of the notable thing about this is this lead pipe rigidity. I've actually seen this a couple of times in the ER. It's very uh, kind of interesting because, you know, you'll be inter interviewing the patient, you'll be trying to examine them, and I'll be like, just relax your arm. And they're like, I, I can't relax my arm. And it's, it just it feels like a lead pipe. Like, it's just so tight. And if, as you might imagine, if you have that muscle uh, contractions that happening so tightly there, muscles getting overworked. That's why you end up seeing the hyperthermia that can develop there. Uh, muscle breakdown can occur eventually, leading to rhabdomyolysis, right? Rhabdomyolysis leads to acidosis, can lead to uh, kidney dysfunction, so it can be pretty bad uh, from that standpoint. So again, um, be aware of this. Be, you know, if you see a patient comes in looking like this, okay, get the drug history, because oftentimes you can kind of key in on something uh, that could be uh, causing that, you know, kind of the smoking gun. So again, if they're on, you know, an SSRI, you wouldn't necessarily think NMS, maybe you think more serotonin syndrome. If they're on haloperidol, you'd be thinking NMS, right? So the history is really key to figuring some of these things out. Because the pathophysiology is different, so you're going to be treating it differently for the most part. Anyway, so this is the list of your first-generation antipsychotics. And again, this is a big list that's been around for quite some time. Uh, has anyone seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? Right, so that actually is about a very smart man who developed uh, schizophrenia. And actually, when he goes on some of the drug therapy, you can see a lot of the effects that he actually develops from those drugs really kind of interesting. Um, so, for instance, I believe the one, one of the drugs he was on was Thorazine or chlorpromazine. It's kind of one of the first ones we had uh, for a while there. Um, the thing to note with this is one, you don't have to memorize every single one on this list because a lot of them we don't actually use clinically too, too frequently. A lot of these are old drugs we don't see used uh, off too, too often. The ones that are highlighted yellow, you do need to know, right? You want to be able to recognize those for testing purposes, right? So chlorpromazine, you still see used occasionally. Uh, things like thyridazine, uh, prochlorperazine. This one I uh, use almost on a daily basis in the ER because we actually use this a lot for migraines, uh, patients coming with migraine headaches, things like that. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, fluphenazine and the haloperidol are also very notable, as we'll mention here in a second. So one thing to note here is that they're, all the side effects here are going to be kind of on a spectrum, right? Um, we have our high-potency D2 blockers, haloperidol and fluphenazine. Notice here, and again, don't memorize, is it four pluses or is it three pluses for this one particular drug? You're going to drive yourself crazy doing that. Um, no pun intended. I want schizophrenia. But um, just know that haloperidol, flufenazine, these are the big deals uh, when it comes to dopamine receptor blockade. These are where you're more likely to see extra pyramidal side effects. You're more likely to see NMS develop from this because of the high potency D2 receptor blockade. Okay? The other ones tend to have a little bit more on the spectrum going towards anti-muscarinic um, uh, sort of effects there, right? So looking at things like chlorpromazine, you're going to see more muscarinic acti anti muscarinic activity. You're going to see <laughs> thyroidazine is really big for this as well. You're also going to see more effects on alpha-1 antagonism. You're also going to see more histamine antagonism. So because of that, you're going to see more of those uh, things like the weight gain, the sedation, uh, those sort of effects are less likely to see EPS, less likely to see things like NMS develop from that. Okay, So again, it's all kind of on a spectrum, but again, the key takeaways I would at least want to know is that Flufenazine, Haloperidol, high potency D2 blockers, much more likely to see EPS and NMS. The other ones tend to be much more anti-muscarinic, antihistaminic, that's where you're going to see a lot more sedation, things like that, same with it. Okay, Now, does it mean the Haloperidol is not going to make you sleepy? No, it's definitely going to knock you out because I've seen, uh, like I said, when you give a little bit of vitamin H, the patient's going to be sleeping pretty well for a while there, right? Uh, but again, it's all on the spectrum here. Um, back when we were doing, like, uh, learning about the vertigo, we learned you can take compensine for nausea. Mm -hmm. How often is it used for just your basic nausea, vomiting versus... It depends. Um, you know, and when you're looking at these drugs, um, another, uh, the chemical classification you may hear for these first-generation drugs are the phenothiazines, right? So uh, prochlorperazine falls into that category. Uh, promethazine also falls into that category, right? So promethazine, one thing you can actually see is extrapyramidal side effects because it does have a little bit of dopamine receptor blockade, right? Because that actually helps out a little bit with the nausea vomiting. The anti-muscarinic stuff also helps out with the nausea vomiting pretty significantly. Um, so uh, it depends on like, what does the patient respond well to, right? So if they have this being more of a chronic problem and they respond very well to that, then give them that, right? Um, oftentimes I will tell you, though, is that at least for nausea vomiting, just strict nausea vomiting, gastroenteritis related or whatever, um, uh, the uh, things like ondansetron or Zofran are much more commonly given because it lacks a lot of these extra side effects, as you'll see. Right? Anyway. Um, and this table here is going to be important as well when we talk about our atypical drugs. You can see the atypicals listed on, on this drugs here. But again, looking at the side effect profile, right? Notice here, chlorpromazine, thyridazine, high on sedation, you know, relatively low to moderate for EPS. 
high on the anticholinergic sort of thing, uh, side of uh, side effects. Orthostasis is higher here versus things like haloperidol, very low, very high on the EPS, right? So again, it's all on the spectrum based on their receptor activity. So that's the kind of the key takeaway I want you guys to, to notice from these, these charts here, okay? We'll talk about the atypicals in just a few minutes. So um, let me finish up with the first generations and I'll give you guys a break. But uh, these are very, very effective for the positive symptoms. These are very good for patients who are coming in with an acute sort of issue where they're having these acute hallucinations, these acute uh, uh, delusions, things like that. Very good for dealing with that. Um, However, a lot of side effects are so very poor from a long-term sort of maintenance uh, sort of uh, standpoint. A lot of times patients are going to discontinue early. Um, and what you want to do is try to pick a, uh, your drug based off of the patient's symptomatology, right? So they're having a lot of the positive symptoms. Let's go ahead and give them something that's going to be more potent at blocking those dopamine receptors. That's what we're going to use something like haloperidol, much more likely, versus if it's something more of the cognitive effects, the more of the negative effects, so maybe using something with more anticholinergic activities can be better for those patients there. Okay, so again, it's all on the spectrum. Any questions from the first half there? I'll tell you one of my favorite patients I ever had in the ER was this guy. Um, we had morning rounds because uh, we were teaching hospitals. So we had morning rounds in the ER at 7 a.m. Um, so we were there, and uh, there's this guy who was he'd been there for like an hour or so, um, you know, for just acute agitation. Uh, I don't know, didn't know his full history, but he was there and he was just screaming at everyone. He was threatening violence. The staff nurses couldn't get near him. He was like, I'm an atom bomb. I'm about to go off. And I'm, with Mike. <laughs> I'm about to blow up. And when I blow up, you guys are not going to see this. And I'm going to, you know, he's just like, really, that was just going off. I mean, he just constantly just would not stop talking. So we're sitting there trying to have rounds, talk about patients. And, you know, it was just like, what the heck's going on with this guy? And so anyway, he's like, I'm about to blow up and, and, and I'm going to just... <laughs> And we're like, oh, what happened? They're like, oh, they gave the Hal doll. They got close enough. Finally, gave him a little shot in the butt, as you said, and and there he goes. So anyway, very good drugs for helping to deal with those really acutely agitated sort of patients. But anywho, so what happens when you have the side effects? Um, EPS, right? Those extra pyramidal side effects. Again, that's due to that dopamine two receptor blockade. Um, again, this is where you see those dystonic reactions, that akathisia that can happen from there. Um, this is typically treated with anticholinergics. Remember we said when you block dopamines, that seesaw effect, you're going to see more acetylcholine activity. By giving antihistamine, which typically a lot of our first generation antihistamines have a lot of anticholinergic activity, you're going to find that you can help to, to mitigate a lot of these symptoms here, which is why if you ever had someone in, as I mentioned, that family who had uh, taken that Haldol on accident with those acute dystonias, basically what we did was give them IV Benadryl. By giving them diphenhydramine as a first generation antihistamine has a lot of anticholinergic activity. It helps to decrease that acetylcholine activity, helps to relieve those dystonias, right? Um, so given that, there's a couple other drugs you can use as well. These are more purely just anticholinergic drugs. We have things like trihexphenidyl, which is known as artane, and you have benztropine or cogentin. Um, all these are going to work just fine for the patient, and very frequently, some people will get the idea that, okay, I'll just give them a dose of Benadryl. They'll look better. You know, they'll they'll have that, uh, the dystonia will kind of resolve, and then they'll just kind of leave them to it, right? They may just say, oh, let's go and just discharge a patient. You have to remember to at least give them at least 24 hours worth, because otherwise the dystonias can come back um, uh, because that drug, you know, the antipsychotic is still in the system. Um, so I want to make sure at least give them 24 hours of therapy, but that is going to be the, the mainstay of therapy for that, okay? So again, if you have acute dystonias, antihistamines, any muscarinics are basically going to be the, the treatment of choice for that, okay? If above all else, if that, that fails, you could also use benzodiazepines. Those are very good muscle relaxing sort of agents that could be uh, used additionally. For tardive dyskinesia, again, this is more the chronic long-term effects of blocking uh, uh, blocking dopamine. You're going to typically find that you want to avoid anticholinergics because this is actually the opposite problem. So uh, given anticholinergic would actually make their issues worse, as the case may be. Oftentimes what we'll do is either try to discontinue therapy if possible. Oftentimes that's going to be a problem, though, because guess what? Their schizophrenia is still there. So you got to treat them with something. So very frequently, we'll switch them over to a second generation agent. Now, back before the second generations were around, you really didn't have a lot of alternatives. And so what we would sometimes do is called drug holidays, right? Which is not just another term for spring break. Um, oftentimes, we give them holidays where you give them a period of time where they would kind of wean off the drug, kind of reset themselves a little bit, and then come back on it, right? So you're getting monitoring them closely to make sure they're not having any relapses. But um, by kind of relieving the body of some of that drug effect for a period of time, hopefully, you can kind of try to stave off that tardive dyskinesia. But again, for a lot of patients, this may be irreversible. So something you want to avoid, if at all possible. For NMS, in some ways, this is treated very similarly to uh, uh, very treated very similar to serotonin syndrome, but there's going to be one key distinction here, as I'll mention in a second. Obviously, if you uh, can't discontinue the offending agent, that could be a problem, though. So, for instance, if I were using a long-acting form of, say, for instance, haloperidol, haloperidol 
is a very commonly known antipsychotic to cause NMS. If I were to say give a patient an IM shot of that, it's meant to last for three months, that could be a problem, right? That's why you don't want to start off a patient on that, that long-acting formula, give it to them orally first to see how they tolerate it. But um, you want to discontinue the fending agent. Because they're hyperthermic, you need to cool them off. We talked about some strategies to do that, either with evaporative cooling or the ice packs, cooled IV saline, things like that. Um, and then hydrate the patient, obviously. That helps to keep the kidneys nice and perfused, so that way that myoglobin doesn't sit there and clog it up. Yes, sir? So it's, um, can we, going back to what you said about the tardive ischemia, yeah. is there like a set time where we switch over to the other agent, or is it just whenever they exhibit symptoms, then you start considering it? So um, I, will, I will say nowadays the most common thing you're going to find is that most patients will get started on a second generation first. So these are not really the first line of therapy they were back in the day. So certainly, though, if you had a patient who maybe was very treatment resistant to the second generation drugs, the atypicals, and you had to give them something like chlorpromazine for the long term, once you started to notice the effects recurring, maybe you would try to, say, switch them back over, right? Um, but it's something you just know is going to happen with longer the uh, longer the duration of therapy is the the bigger the dose you know it's going to happen eventually right so it's one of those things where um it was tough because you know it's a double-edged sword right you know you need to treat the schizophrenia but you know the start of dyskinesia is going to happen eventually yeah well, then in practice you don't really do it that way so yeah well, in practice we would typically start off with the second generation agent first see how they're going to tolerate that and most patients do typically work uh, do very well with the second generation agents um and again that's why you're going to see the second generations pop up in a lot of different things like we mentioned treatment resistant depression we mentioned bipolar disorder they have a lot of uh double and triple duty that they can pull um they're much better tolerated we use this a lot more frequently um these are kind of taking gone by the wayside a little bit but you still use it clinically as i mentioned like you know if you go to any er you're going to find a lot of haloperidol there because you know you have to use it for some of those more acutely uh um, you know, agitated patients for sure yep um if anyone ever says they have a haloperidol allergy, like you know they've seen some stuff, right? So how did you find that out is the, the next question you want to ask, right? So um, just be careful with that. Anywho, so you want to cool down the patient. There's actually a drug we have called dantrolene, which is uh, useful. It's a skeletal muscle relaxant. Um, and basically what this is going to do is to help relieve that, that lead pipe rigidity. Because, and, and, again, that's the kind of the baseline problem. Those muscles are too over-contracted. They're going to eventually uh, wear out and cause, cause breakdown. So by giving dantrolene to relax that muscle is going to help to fix that. There's also something that we'll talk about later in the, the surgery section called malignant hyperthermia. That's the other place you're going to see dantrolene being used as kind of the go-to drug there. So something to know. And then we said that, you know, uh, NMS happens due to dopamine receptor blockade. Well, we can get something to activate those dopamine receptors and hopefully reestablish normal uh, activity. And that's where we can give a drug called bromocryptine, which is a dopamine receptor agonist. I guess it's kind of the alternative you could do. Um, and so most of the time, though, most patients will just give them, um, you get them cooled down and give them some dantrolene. Most of the time they're fine, but occasionally we'll have to use bromocryptine. Okay, so um, refer back to this table. This is we've kind of gone over all this already. We've kind of talked about most of this. Um, just know that um, you know know why the adverse effect is occurring. Know whether it's due to that dopamine blockade or whether it's due to say, for instance, with tardive kinesia, more that dopamine receptor sensitization, and know how to manage it. Right. So again, if I have a patient, if I give you on a test question, patient comes in, um, you know, they're having this acute dystonia, they're having these tongue protrusions, um, you know, they just took a dose of haloperidol. How are you going to manage that? And you would say, give them Benadryl, or I give them an antihistamine. I might have other options on there. I might say, give them a drug holiday. I might say, give them, um, you know, uh, bromocryptine. I might say something, you know, and you'd be able to key in, okay, this is an acute dystonia. It's acute um, extrapyramidal side effect. I'm going to give them an antihistamine, right? So again, uh, it could be an example of a, a question I may ask on a test, right? Um, actually, I had one really interesting case um, that happened when I was in fellowship. There was a, uh, I believe it was like a six month old or something. Um, the mom had a, a host of um, uh, mental health issues on, on addition to having uh, significant drug abuse, but she had the six month old at home. And um, basically the call that we got was saying that the EMS was transporting this baby. It was having uh, what they call a piece of the tonus. I've never heard of that term. If you look it up on Google, you see this like kind of classic um, uh, painting of this guy who's got this very serious back arching that's occurring. Uh, but basically, it's it's a significant uh, muscle contractions, typically causing a lot of back arching, right? Because again, all those muscles in the back are contracting all at the same time. This kid, this six month old was having this and we're trying to figure out well, what the heck is going on. So the drug exposure was a possible risk. Basically the mom had gone into the, to the bedroom, shut the door, said she didn't want to deal with the kid anymore. He got into mom's medications. And so they're trying to figure out what the heck it was. And so all we heard from EMS was they said it was Nubane. The mom, mom, mom had Nubane. Well, if you know anything, Nubane is an opioid analgesic. And we're like, well, that shouldn't cause that. Like, it didn't make sense. You're like, what the heck is going on? And again, you always are working with 
half the history, right? You're only working with uh, bits and pieces of the information. So what we'd actually figured out, once we were able to get a better idea of what the mom was actually taking, was the drug called Navane, which is a brain name for one of these first generation antipsychotics. So once we figured out why that kid was having the back arching due to extra pyramidal side effects from this Navane, we were able to give them Benadryl, relieve the muscle contractions, and the kid did fine. So again, you gotta make sure you're uh, trying to piece through, see why things seem consistent or inconsistent, and that can lead you to coming up with a definitive diagnosis and what the actual treatment's gonna be there, right? Because again, you could have given them some um, benzodiazepines to try to deal with that muscle relaxation, but it wouldn't have been fixing the root cause problem there, right? Due to that acetylcholine affecting those nicotinic receptors, okay? Make sense? Anyway, um, so again, refer back to this. This will be a good chart to, to review for, for testing purposes. Again, if you have a side effect, how are you gonna deal with it, essentially? Okay, so getting into the second generation agents, you're going to find these being used much more commonly. You're going to see them used for other, a lot of off-label sort of uses, you know, so things like treatment-resistant depression, etc. Um, and so another name, again, is the atypical antipsychotics here. Um, these have much fewer side effects associated with extrapyramidal effects, much less prolactin level increases, because you're going to find while they have a little bit of dopamine to receptor blockade, that's not the main feature, right? That's not the main mechanism of action of these drugs. The main thing they're going to be doing is blocking the serotonin 2A receptors, okay? That's in the main activity. I'll show you that chart again in a second so you see where they're working. These are going to be much more efficacious for the negative and the cognitive symptoms. Again, when you're looking at the um, uh, the first generation, you know they were great for positive symptoms, but actually they could worsen the negative and the cognitive effects here. Um, this is actually going to be working on all of them, as we'll see in just a moment here. Um, much less tardive dyskinesia. A lot of patients will not develop tardive dyskinesia with prolonged use here, and it should be used first unless otherwise contraindicated, right? So if you could not use the second generation, that's when you'd want to switch over to first generation. But nowadays, most patients are managed on these. So as I mentioned, much less activity on the D2 receptors is gonna have much less EPS. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen a patient have an acute dystonia um, uh, associated with a second generation agent. The main thing they're doing though is blocking that serotonin 2A receptor, okay? Again, it's gonna be mainly affecting that cortex. We'll see how it's gonna help the, with the positive symptoms here in just a moment as well. So if you're looking again at this chart, uh, if you imagine, you see here, let me get the laser pointer. Notice here the, the five serotonin 2A receptors right here. Notice here that negative sign. That means it's an inhibitory sort of receptor. So if I were to inhibit, um, uh, if I were to release serotonin here, this would have a negative effect and we have less dopamine release, right? We mentioned that's what causes a lot of those negative symptoms is that lack of dopamine activity in the cortex, right? Well, if I go ahead and inhibit this, if I were to block up that receptor, they're going to find that this will lead to more dopamine being released here, which is good. So you're going to release more dopamine. It's going to be activating this. You're going to be relieving those negative symptoms, those cognitive symptoms. And additionally, you're going to find um, that by working on this as well, you're going to eventually lead to decreased effects here because this is a, another negative inhibitory sort of neuron here. By activating it, you're going to be releasing inhibitory neurotransmitters here. That's going to be decreasing dopamine release from this one. So, right. so now you can see by working on this receptor right here with serotonin, you affect both frontal cortex activity, you fix that problem by releasing more dopamine, and then through this, uh, this circuit here, you're going to find you're going to be decreasing dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so that way you deal with the positive symptoms as well. That's why they tend to be so effective. So side, side effects you're going to be seeing with this. Um, these are going to be much more important for the chronic use of these drugs uh, from a metabolic standpoint. So uh, a lot of them tend to have a lot of weight gain associated with them. Um, this is going to be highest with olanzapine. It is not uncommon for a patient you start on olanzapine to end up you know, gaining 10, 20, 30 pounds. Right? Oftentimes, if they had, uh, gain more than 5% of their baseline weight, typically you need to switch them over to something else, right? Uh, so it's a very common side effect you're going to see with those. Probably lowest with something like ziprasidone and aripiprazole. And again, I'll show you the chart in a few minutes that gives all the second generation drugs. Um, so the lowest incidence there. You can also find that it can lead to uh, glucose intolerance, which can actually uh, induce uh, you know, type 2 diabetes or uncover maybe in some patients, uh, especially clozapine tends to be uh, more common with that. And then you're going to see some hyperlipidemia. Okay. And again, this is in addition to if that patient had the, all, any of these effects to begin with, right? And again, most of the time they're not taking care of themselves very well. They're probably not eating right. So they probably have some of this at baseline anyway, and this is just going to potentially worsen it. Uh, a unique thing with one of these called clozapine is agranulocytosis. And this is actually a 1% incidence, which is, doesn't sound like it's too much, but, um, you know, one in every hundred patients, like you know, it's, it's a little too risky. This is actually gonna be a drug you want to reserve for a patient who have failed probably two or three other drugs. So you really wanna hold off on using clozapine because of this incidence here. And so because of that, there's actually a, a REMS program. You guys remember REMS programs I mentioned before? What are those? 
risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, right? So they try to mitigate the risk associated with some of these drugs. So remember Accutane, what do you have to do when you're on Accutane? Pregnancy tests, you have to go to all the, you have to be registered, the, the provider has to be registered, the pharmacy has to be registered, the patient. Same thing happens here with clozapine because you have to make sure the patient's going to be coming in to get those CBCs done and make sure they don't develop this agranulocytosis. cytosis. As they develop agranulocytosis, cytosis, what happens then? They don't have an immune system, die from infection, right? So you have to make sure you're monitoring that. We already said adherence for a lot of these patients is very uh, dodgy in the first place. So again, if they're not coming in to get those labs done, they don't want to be giving those, that patient that, those drugs, right? So, uh, so clozapine is a unique thing associated just with that drug. Um, other things you can see, cardiac effects, including QT prolongation. So most of the second generation drugs will cause some QT prolongation. Now, again, is this a problem in and of itself? Not usually, but again, when you start to mix other drugs together, this is where you can run into issues, right? So again, if I were to say, have a patient either take an overdose of one of these, that can be a problem, or if you were to mix and match several of these together. So for instance, I had a patient who had depression, and they were on an SSRI. Anyone remember the SSRI that causes QT prolongation? There's two of them. Citalopram and escitalopram. If I were to mix that on top of something like ketiapine or aripiprazole or something like that, that's where you can start to see issues there, right? So again, a lot of these patients, you gotta make sure you're getting uh, baseline EKGs and then you can monitor uh, if you're concerned about things like, you know, overdoses and whatnot, right? Um, you see some orthostatic hypotension, so a little bit of alpha antagonism you can see with these. Most often you're gonna find this more common with like IM and IV doses. When you get that big dose all at once, they tend to see a little bit more of that. Um, and then also elderly patients tend to be more at risk. You have to be, be careful with those patients. Um, typically over the course of two or three months or so, they should become pretty tolerant to it though. Now, one thing to note um, is that there's a black box warning for these drugs that you do not want to use this to treat elderly related dementia. Okay, so we know, especially patients who end up in the hospital, you know, I'm getting some my experience where I, I, I speak most from, um, these elderly patients, when the sun goes down, what happens with them? They get a little kooky, right? So you get this dementia that can be worsened by the fact they're in an unfamiliar environment. They're surrounded by unfamiliar people. Um, they're probably sick with something, either infection or otherwise. Um, and so they can have this ultramental status. They can become agitated, can become uh, potentially violent in some cases. Um, your gut reaction is say, well, let's give them an antipsychotic to, uh, to, to manage that. Um, you do not want to do that because there's actually been uh, an increased risk of death seen with those patients, enough to where the FDA went ahead and put a black box warning on these drugs. Um, there are other drugs you can use. We'll talk about those later on. Uh, but antipsychotics are not going to be the, the agency to use for those. And this applies to both second and first generation agents. Okay, so just note that. Um, other big things include sedation. So especially things like ketiapine, olanzapine, clozapine, all tend to cause pretty significant sedation. Um, and so often we'll give them at you know, at bedtime, right? So QHS dosing, given it at nighttime um, to help kind of mitigate some of that. Um, it's actually kind of a funny comedian I was uh, listening to at one point. And he's, he says that um, he was at his girlfriend's house at the time uh, and there's this like construction that was going on outside. It was just keeping him up all hours of the night. He just couldn't get any sleep. So his girlfriend was like, oh, well, here, take this. It was a Seroquel uh, with brain name for ketiapine. So here, take a Seroquel, it'll be fine. And so he said he was, uh, it's okay. So he took it and went to go to the bathroom before he went to bed and he fell asleep standing up, caught himself right before he hit the wall, right? So, wow, this stuff is really, really good for sleep. Like, holy cow, I slept better than I ever slept in my entire life. And so then he's, he went to go look up the drug the next day and actually saw what it was being used for. Or saw what it's typically used for, which is schizophrenia. And all of a sudden he's like, wait a second, why does my girlfriend have this? <laughs> so, but be careful, because you know, uh, drugs can be used for multiple purposes, right? So you don't necessarily want to jump to conclusions there. However, um, you know, sometimes this will be used as a sleep agent. As I mentioned, a lot of sleep agents tend to be controlled substances. So it was common back before, uh, and again, depending on where you were at, for like mid-level practitioners and nurse practitioners, PAs to write for these sort of drugs because they could do it without having um, uh, you know, DEA license and all of that. So um, probably see this done less commonly, especially here now that you guys will be able to write for controlled substances. But um, just be aware that it could be, if you ever see like uh, people taking low dose Seroquel at nighttime QHS dosing, that's typically what it's being used for there. Okay. Um, a lot of these also have a lot of significant anticholinergic activities, so especially clozapine and olanzapine is known for this. A lot of dry mouth, a lot of constipation seen with that. So again, uh, we know that mnemonic there. And then um, potentially seizures, and this is more seen at overdose. Right, so um, clozapine and olanzapine tend to have the highest risk with that as well. Right, so again, overall, it sounds like clozapine and olanzapine probably not the best out of the, of the group here. Um, most of the side effects you're going to be seeing more pronounced with those agents. But sometimes, if they fail everything else, those are the ones you have to, to finally land on. So uh, generally, as far as interactions go with either first or second generation drugs, it's typically pharmacodynamic. So if they're on something else that's going to be causing CNS depression, this is just going to worsen it, right? So again, substance abuse is a big problem in these patients. If they're drinking alcohol, this is going to worsen that sedation, right? Um, orthostatic hypotension. If they're on antihypertensives, it's going to worsen that. Uh, so just be aware of that. 
And then if you were to combine, say, other dopamine blockers, this is where you increase your risk for things like EPS. Okay, so typically, second generation agents do not cause EPS on their own. Because again, their main action is they're going to be blocking the serotonin receptors. But if you start to add on other drugs that are blocking that, that can be a problem. So for instance, if you had a patient who was on, say, olanzapine, coming into the ER for nausea and vomiting, and I were to give them an antiemetic that had dopamine receptor blockade as well, that can where you can start to see the EPS pop up. So something like promethazine or phenergan, again, has some of that dopamine receptor blockade, something like metoclopramide or reglan. We'll talk about this more in the, uh, the GI section when we get into the antiemetics, but just know these have a little bit of uh, dopamine receptor blockade that can worsen that. And again, here is the list of different ones here. Now, note um, there's always uh, new ones that are coming out. This kind of a, was a, um, you know, kind of one of those blockbuster sort of like uh, section of drugs where there's kind of like Me Too's always coming out. Um, it's probably died down a little bit, but you're going to find there's other new ones on here that I don't uh, include on this list. Um, but, you know, be familiar with all of these, right? Because, again, they're very commonly used more so than the first generation agents. Uh, so be able to, to recognize those, right? And remember, clozapine is a big one that causes a granulocytosis, you'd have that registration program they're going to be signing up with. Um, do not use this one as a, as a first line go to. But a lot of people, you know, like aripiprazole, I see a lot of people uh, utilizing things like um, ketiapine pretty commonly or spiridone. They tend to have fewer of the side effects associated with them out of the bunch. Um, but again, you can kind of get a relative comparative efficacy here or a relative side effects you're going to be seeing with these. And again, don't memorize this at one star, two star. Doesn't really matter. Just get the broad strokes you're going to be seeing with these, right? And again, if I talked about it on a particular slide, like olanzapine and weight gain, like that's something you want to key in on, right? Those are things you want to be able to, to um, pull out. Okay. Um, other, some other new ones you may see occasionally. Um, I'm not going to put these on the test, but just so you can be familiar and see that, again, there's always new ones that are coming out. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, again, if you see a drug on a patient's list and they're coming in, you don't know what it is, what are you going to do? Look it up. But at least when you see that, okay, it's a second generation antipsychotic, guess what? You know a lot of things about anti, uh, antipsychotics now, right? So again, just by looking it up, seeing what class it goes into, you already know a lot of things about it. In fact, uh, it happens to me pretty frequently. I have a patient will come in on a weird drug, but I've never heard of that in my entire life. However, you as a practitioner, you want to at least appear confident. You'd be like, oh, interesting, they're on that drug. Hmm, yes. But then you go look it up. You're like, oh, okay, so it falls into this class. Okay, yes, now I do actually have confidence. Yes, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? So be, be, uh, be willing to do that, right? But... You don't be like, oh, I've never heard of that. Like, cause you don't, you don't look very, uh, very, very professional. But he's like, mm -hmm, yeah, great. And then go look it up and then come back and say, yes, I am confident now. That's what I do here all the time. Like, you guys think I know everything, but really I'm just like, oh. Mm. But I appear confident when I do it. Um, Okay, so again, uh, this is good to look at relative comparative uh, adverse effect profiles between the first generation and the second generation agents here. Um, again, just get the broad strokes here. Notice you can see a lot more sedation. And in fact, the atypicals look pretty much like the, the typical low potency sort of um, uh, first generation agents, but EPS is going to be even less risk with the second uh, generation ones because of that um, uh, lack or relative lack of dopamine receptor blockade compared to the first generations and a lot more serotonin activity there. Okay. I'm not going to belabor all these points, but again, it's good for a reference. All right. Uh, other things you want to monitor when uh, dealing with antipsychotics, monitor for weight, look at their blood pressure, their lipids, look for the metabolic effects you're going to be having over the long term there. Um, and again, look for any other antipsychotic effects. You know, if they're having EPS, like let them know what to look for so that way they don't think it's just normal or just they're you know, this is just how I am now. I have these weird tongue protrusions. No, that's not normal. You need to let them know what to look for so that way they can come back and go, oh, hey, I have that thing you were talking about. And you can decide if you want to switch them to something else or change the dose, whatever the case may be. Okay, so for acute treatment, um, when you're initiating drugs here, you're going to find that typically the main goal for sort of acute issues is going to be to decrease those positive symptoms. So that's why um, you can find that your first generation uh, uh, antipsychotics are very good for this. Things like haloperidol, very good for that. Nowadays, I'm actually starting to see, especially in the ER setting, more and more people are moving to things like geodon uh, or zeprasidone uh, being used very commonly, IM, to, to deal with those acute agitated patients there. Um, sometimes patients even need additional benzodiazepines on top of that, right? So they need some additional um, uh, Ativan or uh, lorazepam used pretty frequently to try to calm or sedate those patients there. Um, now, if they're not in an acute episode like that, they're not having active positive sort of symptoms there, then you don't have to worry about that so much. You can start them on a second generation agent and you know give them time to titrate up that dose and as they tolerate it and as, as uh, efficacious there. Usually, if there's no improvement in symptoms in three to four weeks or so, um, and again, every patient's going to respond a little differently to these drugs. Um, at that point, you can consider whether a change in dose or a change in drug is going to be necessary there, right? Um, and as I mentioned, patients with compliance issues, which is common in this, uh, this patient population, uh, we have injectable forms, right? So they typically come 
come in a, an oil base um, that sits in the muscle for usually three months at a time or so, and they'll be slowly leached into the bloodstream over a period of time. Those can be very useful. Now, again, you don't want to start a patient on IM dosing because once you put the drug in, can you get it back out? Not really, right? So they're going to have a bad time with it. There's going to be three months of them having a bad time with it. You don't want to do that. Start them off on something oral, see how they tolerate it, and then if they are doing well with it, then you can switch them over to something like an IM long-acting formulation, right? Okay, so if you were to manage these patients here, and again, um, I'm not going to get into big on the, the staging and whatnot, but basically um, looking at how they're going to be uh, managed here, typically you want to start off with a second generation agent first, right? So something like aripiprazole, uh, risperidone, zepracidone, these are all really good agents to start with. The side effect profile is relatively favorable versus something like olanzapine, right, or clozapine. Um, and again, you always want to ask, like, what have you been on previously? What did you respond well to? What did you not respond well to? Get that history first, because that will, again, lead you to deciding if you want to go with a particular drug or not. Um, looking at how they're responding to it, you know, if they are still failing therapy, that's when you can start to consider things like, um, you know, if they've had one or two failures, we can start to consider the first generation agent. Um, typically, clozapine is going to be kind of last resort for patients who kind of failed everything else, essentially, right? And again, we always like to use monotherapy whenever possible. We typically do not want to combine multiple antipsychotic drugs together because you're just going to be worsening the EPS. You're just going to be worsening uh, other things like that. But, you know, occasionally you may have a patient who's on a mood stabilizer plus an antipsychotic. Again, you have to kind of treat each component of their behavioral health, um, uh, you know, individually. Uh, but you can be aware of those side effect interactions that can happen uh, between those, right? Okay. As I mentioned, um, typically these patients are going to, if they want to discontinue therapy, it needs to be on a taper. What you find is if they abruptly discontinue therapy, they're going to develop uh, the typical relapse uh, with their symptoms there. So you want to make sure you're going to be titrating slowly. If they start to have kind of withdrawal effects like insomnia, agitation, anxiety, anything like that, um, you know, go back up on the lowest dose that they tolerate it, and then again, try to retaper again over the two-week period or so. If you're switching agents, this is where, again, you don't want to give them you don't want to cut them off cold turkey, you're going to be titrating down on one as you're titrating up on the other. So it may take a few weeks to do so, but that helps to limit uh, that, that possible chance for them to relapse. As I mentioned, some of the GI symptoms, or the withdrawal symptoms here, things like nightmares, insomnia, et cetera, uh, it's going to be pretty uh, distressing for the patient there. Okay, so any questions on that section? I'm going to feel they probably want to give me a shot of how it all possibly. Okay, um, let's talk about our anxiolytics. Something I wish I could like, sometimes I could just, uh, before test days, I wish I could just like kind of puff into the room and just a little bit of some of these anxiolytics. I just want you guys just to stop, stop stressing out, you know? You can worry about everything, panic about nothing. That's a common saying that I like now. Uh, anyway, a lot of different anxiety disorders that are out there, um, you know, generalized anxiety disorders, panic disorders, o OCD, uh, PTSD, all of them are going to be managed pretty similarly to, to one another as we're going to see here. I'm not going to get into the specifics, uh, details between them, but in general, when you're dealing with anxiety, you're going to be, uh, there's the maintenance therapy, hopefully will prevent anxiety attacks, and there's also going to be the acute therapy. So we're going to, again, going to see there's a little bit of difference in, in therapy we're going to use for that. Um, now, typically, this is a maladaptive sort of a response to stress. Like stress is a good thing. Anxiety is a good thing because it helps us, you know, to keep away from things that are bad for us, right? So again, if a bear pops out, I should be anxious about that. I should probably get away from that bear. However, you know, when it's a chronic thing and it kind of leads to um, sort of inappropriate responses, that's where it can become a problem. That's where we're going to try to interrupt that. And so we're going to see that uh, norepinephrine is playing a big role here. Serotonin is playing a big role and GABA is playing a big role. Okay. So these are mainly the neurotransmitters we're going to try to affect when we're giving drugs for anxiety, as we'll see. So, um, there's a lot of drugs that can actually induce anxiety in the patients. You want to be aware of those, so that way you can say, well, you know, do I want to necessarily treat the anxiety that they're having with another drug, or do I want to maybe deal with the drug that's actually causing it in the first place? So, for instance, things like antipsychotics, that akathisia can appear as anxiety, right? So, again, discontinue the drug or switch over to something else, right? Um, things like digoxin toxicity, right? What do we use digoxin for? AFib. CHF, right? So again, you get patients developing toxicity from that. A lot of stimulants and uh, sympathomimetics. When I say stimulants and sympathomimetics, what kind of drugs am I talking about? Amphetamines. Cocaine's another big one. Pseudoephedrine. There's a lot of stimulants that are out there. Caffeine can manifest as that. So maybe, you know, maybe drinking a huge cup of coffee right before a test, not the best thing for your anxiety, right? Perhaps. Um, 
uh, you know, other things like uh, anticholinergics, a lot of drug withdrawal can actually appear as anxiety or can manifest as anxiety. Things like ethanol withdrawal, opioids, benzodiazepines themselves all can induce anxiety in a patient. So again, get the history, figure out if the drug either being there is causing anxiety or maybe the withdrawal of the drug is causing it. Uh, as far as treatment goes, obviously supportive therapy is going to be the first line uh, for any of these patients, but as far as pharmacotherapy goes, for acute anxiety, if you have any acute panic attack or acute anxiety attack, this is where things like benzodiazepines are going to be very useful. Again, I'm going to go into more detail on that in the neurology section, but you can imagine by helping GABA to work better, by increasing that chloride influx into those neurons, you're going to slow everything down, you're going to get much less anxious, right? So again, I know none of you have ever, uh, you know, alcohol has never passed any of your lips before, but imagine you've been anxious before and had a couple of beers, guess what? You feel less anxious afterward, right? Same thing happens with these benzodiazepines. They help GABA to work better, dealing with that anxiety by hyperpolarizing those neurons there, okay? Um, chronic management is gonna be more focusing on the antidepressants. This is where things where, you know, when you're dealing with a patient with depression, oftentimes there's a component of anxiety there you need to deal with as well. This is where things like SSRIs are gonna be very good for that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then we have a couple of alternative agents. We have things like buspirone to talk about. And then rarely we may involve a second generation antipsychotic occasionally, but uh, it can be done uh, every once in a while. So typically with our antidepressants, and again, mainly SSRIs, but you could also use an SNRI as well, um, are going to be pretty good for long-term management of generalized anxiety disorders. Um, other things that actually have an approval for it from the FDA include things like vindolafaxine, duloxetine, which fall into which category? SNRI, good. And then paroxetine, escitalopram, which are just SSRIs, good. Um, even in some cases, you may try using things like tricyclic antidepressants, so something like imipramine um, is going to be uh, occasionally used, but again, a lot bigger side effect profile. But what's the main side effect of a lot of those TCAs? Sedation is going to be a big one, right? So sedation helps deal with that anxiety, right? So again, you're slowing down the CNS, so that's all going to be uh, useful there. So sometimes that can be a little bit better, but side effect profile for TCAs are generally unfavorable compared to SSRI or SNRI. So um, again, we don't know the full mechanism of why they work. We just know that by interrupting the cycle here, maybe we're helping to deal with some of those stress adapting sort of pathways, who knows? But again, are they gonna kick in immediately? No, they're gonna take time to work, right? It's gonna take at least several weeks before you really see the full, uh, full effects there. Um, again, be aware of the adverse effects. We've talked about those uh, previously. Now looking at the benzodiazepines, how these are going to work, and again, they don't specifically activate the GABA-A receptor, but what they're going to do is actually facilitate GABA working better. So if you'll see here, we have uh, benzodiazepines going to come in and bind to a receptor site. This is going to help to facilitate GABA binding even more readily. So it's going to help GABA bind uh, more easily. It's going to open up these uh, channels here, and this is going to allow chloride to flow along the concentration gradient into that neuron. And then the electric potential for this neuron goes what? Goes down, gets more negative, which means it's much harder to have an action potential. So the same mechanism that we're using for anxiety is the same thing that works for seizures, right? So we're going to see there's a lot of double duty that's being, uh, being played here. So available agents, and there's a lot of them, uh, but a lot of these actually do get used with some regularity there. So you have things like alprazolam, chlordiaz epoxide is actually one of the first ones we ever had, um, clobazam. Some of these are going to be more custom uh, tailored towards epilepsy. Some of these are going to be more oftentimes used for anxiety. These can also be used for things like sleep. So you're going to see a lot of different uses for these benzodiazepines. Um, some of them are going to be available as an injectable product. Some of these are going to be available orally. Uh, a lot of them are actually available orally, but um, and you'll get a feel for them when you actually use them out in, in clinicals, how, you know, what forms are going to be coming in. I will tell you um, that usually if you had a patient presenting, say, to the ER for an acute anxiety attack, uh, parenteral forms are going to be better, right? So injectable forms, you can use things like um, intramuscular or IV midazolam, right? Which is Versed. It's a very common one we use in the hospital. Um, lorazepam or Ativan, also another very common one we like to use in the hospital from an injectable sort of standpoint. Other uh, ones are going to be available orally, uh, but we'll talk about these in more detail when we get to the um, uh, neurology section as well. Now, notice here I have a few of these that are starred. Those are lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam, and triazolam. These are the LOT, L-O-T-T, uh, benzodiazepines, I star these because these are uh, particularly good for elderly patients. So if you imagine in an elderly patient, if I were to give them a benzodiazepine, it's going to cause a lot of sedation, generally cause orthostatic hypotension because they're pretty specific for the GABA-A receptor, but um, you can see a lot of sedation, you can see falls associated with that, uh, ataxia, etc. you know, leading to those falls. Um, so you don't want to use something that has a really long half-life. You don't want to use something that has uh, active metabolites because of the fact that those elderly patients are less likely to be able to clear that very well. Either their liver function is going down, their uh, um, 
kidney function is going down, it tends to lead to increased half-life for a lot of these drugs. So also, there's a the factor of whether or not things are fat-soluble or not, you know, uh, whether they're more water-soluble or fat-soluble. Typically, fat-soluble drugs, do you think they stick around for longer or shorter periods of time? Let's say a more water-soluble one. Probably longer, right? Because again, they can get to the tissues. They're more fat soluble. They're going to sit there in the tissues. That typically increases the duration of action for that drug as well. Because even if you stop taking the drug, it'll still leach out of the fat and, and can still interact. Um, so we like to use in elderly patients short-acting drugs that don't have active metabolites and are more water soluble. This helps with the clearance and get out of the elderly patients there. So um, we'll talk about geriatrics later on in the class. But these are the the benzos that we like for those patients, those elderly patients, and that includes lorazepam, oxazepam, triazolam, and uh, temazepam. A lot of benzodiazepines. If you have a relatively young, healthy patient, any of these other ones would be totally fine as well. Okay. All right. Other uses as I mentioned for benzos you're going to find for seizures, uh, acute agitation. Uh, we use it as muscle relaxants pretty commonly as well. Uh, I use it for sedation. Uh, so you'll find a lot of uh, uses for the benzodiazepines, especially if you work in surgery or the ER or anywhere like that. You're going to get a lot of use out of these drugs um, because they have uh, such a wide range of uh, uses uh, for them. Actually, kind of nice. We will do sometimes uh, is we'll actually use intranasal uh, midazolam for some of our patients. So if you imagine a little kid coming into the ER, it's a pretty scary sort of situation for them. And they say, oh, we have to we have to give you an IV. We have to give you a shot. What do you think happens to them? They get pretty anxious, right? So they're really worried about it. So sometimes we'll actually give them intranasal uh, midazolam. And that's a, uh, will absorb very well and actually have to chill them out a little bit. So that way you can, you can you know suture up their laceration or you can give them, uh, you know, get an IV start or whatever you need. Uh, so a lot of use out of these benzodiazepines. Uh, as I mentioned with the kinetics there, um, oftentimes the uh, the onset of action is related to the lipophilicity or the how fat soluble they are. So if it's more fat soluble, crosses that blood brain barrier much more easily, it's going to have a lot faster onset. And again, which one do you think has faster onset, IV or PO? Okay. Obviously, IV is going to be great. What do you think about intranasal? What do you think it would fit in? Kind of closer to IV, but a little bit slower, right? Because again, it has to cross the, those, uh, those mucous membranes there and actually get absorbed into the, the circulation there. Also be aware that uh, some benzodiazepines are going to be metabolized through CYP3A4, so they're going to be susceptible to those interactions there, um, except for lorazepam, clonazepam, and oxazepam, right? So again, some of those lot drugs already fall into that category. They avoid those CYP drug interactions, which makes them favorable for the elderly patients. We're probably on a lot of drugs anyway that may be interacting with CYP3 or 4. Um, as I mentioned, if liver dysfunction, typically you're going to be clearing these a lot slower. And then uh, some of them do have active metabolites. When I say active metabolites, it just means it's a breakdown product that still has activity, right? So again, those are the things you want to avoid for your elderly patients who may not be able to clear it very well. So adverse effects is going to be CNS depression is the number one thing you're going to see with this, uh, especially if you're combining it with anything else that's going to cause um, uh, sedation, right? So again, this is why you don't want to mix benzodiazepines with alcohol. You don't want to mix it with, um, say, for instance, if you mix it with an antipsychotic, if you were to mix it with a TCA, you're going to see synergistic CNS depression associated with this, right? Now, that will you develop tolerance to that over time. So you may find that you know initially you may get really sleepy on a particular dose. Over time, that may dissipate as you get more tolerant to having that benzodiazepine effect around. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that in some cases you may actually have what we call a paradoxical excitation. What do you think that means? Yeah, so instead of getting really sleepy, I give you a dose of a benzodiazepine. I expect you to get sleepy, but all of a sudden they get really agitated and they're crawling down all, all up the walls. This is sometimes seen with children. Um, you see this more, more commonly. I kind of mentioned this uh, also occurs sometimes with antihistamines. Like if you ever give Benadryl to a little kid and they get really excited off of it, uh, that, or sometimes with adults as well. Um, but it's that paradoxical excitation you see with that, right? So it's paradox because it's not consistent with what you would expect to see. Um, this can happen with the benzodiazepines as well. Typically, the way to manage that is just give them more benzos. Usually you can try to overwhelm the system and that's going to uh, work overall. Uh, but you're also going to see memory impairment. It's actually kind of a good thing, especially if you're going in, say, for a procedure or something. You'll end up developing that amnesia, that anterograde amnesia. We're going to forget things that are happening to you. So maybe you, know, you had that femur fracture, but once you got the benzos, you kind of chilled out a little bit and you don't really remember them setting it later on. You know, all of those good. Um, as I mentioned, be aware of that, that synergism with other CNS depressants. Typically, benzodiazepines are very, very safe on their own. You should not see really any respiratory depression uh, with it unless you're combining it with other things, right? Unless you give them a really big IV dose all at once, or if you were to combine it with other respiratory depressants, that's where you're going to run into problems, there, right? And so there's a, a common saying in, in toxicology that the only way you can die from a pure benzodiazepine overdose is if you get hit with a truck that's delivering it, right? Um, so you can take a lot of this stuff and not really run into too many issues. They may be very sleepy, but they shouldn't really have a lot of respiratory depression associated with that, unless you mix and match, right? And so it's very common. I would see a lot of patients who had overdosed on uh, usually uh, we call it oxysomonex. 
because it was usually uh, oxycodone, which is an opiate. They have a drug called Soma, which is a muscle relaxant, and they mix it with um, uh, Xanax. Now, those three together definitely can cause some very significant CNS depression, respiratory depression, necessitating intubation. Uh, so very common thing you would see in, in ER. Anywho, um, other things you can find is uh, this withdrawal phenomenon. You gotta be careful with the withdrawal from these drugs because withdrawal from benzodiazepines can be fatal. We talk about opioids later on, we'll say that, you know, people are withdrawing from opioids and may want to die, but they're not going to die from that, right? This, this can be fatal because what do you think happens if I, the body gets used to having all this GABA activity around and all of a sudden I take it away immediately? What happens? You're going to see over excitation of those neurons leading to seizures, right? So you can certainly see some insomnia, you see agitation, but this can develop all the way into seizures that can develop here, right? So just like you see with the alcohol withdrawal, people can die from those seizures they develop from that. Same thing can happen here with these benzodiazepines. So you want to make sure you are titrating down slowly uh, if they're going to be on it chronically, which is why we like to use these for, for typically for short courses for something like uh, anxiety or just on an as-needed basis. You don't want them to take this every single day. However, if they're taking it for seizures, they do have to take it on a chronic basis. That's something you definitely would want to taper from. Um, so anyway, so we'll talk more about the benzos when we get into the, um, uh, the neurology section a little bit later on, so we can talk about them more in detail there as well. But just have a general idea how they're, they're useful for, for anxiety. So, and again, if I were to ask you on a test question, like, you know, what, you know, patient comes in, they say they only have occasional anxiety. It's usually around when they have to, um, you know, uh, go to work or go to, you know, take a test or something like that. Um, you know, how often, you know, what would be a good dosing regimen for their benzos? You know, if I said something like, you know, twice a day, every single day, you'd say, well, that's not really effective, right? That would be good for that patient because it's only, uh, it's only an occasional thing. It's only intermittent sort of thing. That's more you'd want to use it more like an as needed sort of basis there. So if you can't avoid using chronic benzos, unless you really need to, unless it's really kind of a chronic issue there. Okay. Anyway, some other drugs we have include buspirone or buspar. This is a, uh, another anxiolytic that's a non-benzodiazepine, so it's kind of working through um, a different mechanism. I'm not really sure how it works, but we just know that it tends to work. Probably not going to be nearly as effective. Um, it's not going to be really as a good first-line drug for anxiety. Usually the SSRIs are kind of taken over as being a better kind of chronic sort of uh, drug for that. Um, but just be aware that it's going to be um, need to be taken consistently and for more than two weeks or so before you really start to see full effects there. But pretty well tolerated, not a lot of issues uh, seen with this drug uh, for most patients who take it. The other nice thing here is there's no dependence that develops with this. And I guess it's kind of a topic we'll get into when we talk about the opioids. Um, but when you have a patient who's, say, taking benzos all the time, uh, and then they come off and they're withdrawing, is that addiction? Would you term that addiction? No. Addiction is going to be where people are taking the drug despite the obvious negative consequences, despite the harm that it's causing for them, um, it's dependence of what they're developing, right? There's a physical dependence you can have. Patients can become physically dependent to something without being addicted to it. So I want to make sure you kind of get that delineation in your mind um, that, you know, just because you're withdrawing from a drug doesn't mean you're addicted to it. It just means you had a physical uh, tolerance or a physical dependence on that drug, okay? Uh, your body's new homeostasis was used to having that drug around, and now you've interrupted that, okay? We'll talk more about that in the opioid section later on. Uh, but the nice thing here is that all the benzodiazepines are typically habit forming. They they develop that physical tolerance or physical dependence on that. But buspirone, it's a non, does not cause dependence, which is nice. It's one of a, a good alternative. If you got a patient who maybe was not a good candidate for a benzo. Um, again, it probably has something to do with serotonin and how it's working, but we don't know the full mechanism there, and very well tolerated. However, note that it's metabolized by CYP3A4, so it is susceptible to those interactions. Okay, um, so next we have our beta blockers. Why do you think we use beta blockers? for anxiety? Slow down the heart rate. What's it good for? You got all those beta receptors on the skeletal muscle. It causes tremors. It helps to deal with that. So I mean, this is good for um, sort of acute intermittent sort of anxiety issues. So say, for instance, if I called on one of you to randomly come up here and give the rest of the lecture, would that induce anxiety in most of you? I'd probably say yes, right? right? A little bit of anxiety, right? Um, Beta blockers can be useful for the physical aspects of that, right? So it's not going to necessarily make you feel less anxious, but it's going to do with the heart rate, it's going to do with the sweating, it's going to do with the tremor. It's better for things where you need to keep all your mental faculties about you. So for instance, if you got really nervous before taking a test, would you rather take a benzodiazepine or would you rather take a beta blocker? Probably rather take the beta blockers. You're going to need you, have to, you don't want to cause any mental fogging, any mental slowness to occur there because you need to take that test. You need to answer those questions. Otherwise, you'll find you asleep you know, after the 50-minute mark is up and then... <clears throat> You failed the test, that's no good. So you, beta blockers are a lot better from that standpoint, though. Um, usually propranolol is the most common one we'll see being used. Now, is that one cardioselective or not cardioselective? Non-selective, right? So propranolol would not be good for what type of patient? Non-selective. 
as bad patient, good. We can use something like atenolol instead of those cases there. So again, go back and review. You know, you guys know what the side effects of beta blockers are going to be, um, and know who, you know, which ones are going to be better for certain types of patients. So you can kind of review that. Uh, make sure they're taking at least an hour before the performance. You want to like, say, for instance, just take it and then go do whatever the thing was that caused you anxiety because you need time for the drug to absorb and kind of kick in. And typically, you want them to at least have a test dose beforehand, right? So you don't want to necessarily, you know, if they need to get up and, and give a big speech and it's a one-time thing, um, you don't want them to try the dr drug for that first time and then have a really bad reaction to it or have uh, intolerable side effects. So have them try it beforehand, see how they uh, deal with it, and then, you know, use it whenever or they need to, right? So again, this would be more of a PRN as needed sort of basis here. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop here because I'm out of time. Uh, but we'll finish up, uh, I think, tomorrow is when we meet again, and then we'll move on into, uh, I think I'm just going to go into the neurology section. So just, if you want to download that, that will be available to you. Any questions? I'm going to look at the board real quick.